All right, welcome everyone to the Sunday Speedrunner Spotlight, episode 28. It's a large number. Keeps growing. Speaking of large, someone that has a large speedrun.com profile. Author Blues, how's it going? What a segue. I know. Hey, hi. Had it planned, you know? No. Welcome, welcome. Thanks. Thanks it for is, having me. Yeah, thanks for being on. Uh, you've speedran a lot of games, I'd say. <laughs> As I, I said. would say so too. Yeah, so let's talk about that, why don't we? By starting at the beginning, how did you get started here? Um, so I started speedrunning in 2013. Uh, I'm actually next month coming up on my 10 year anniversary of streaming, which was also when I started speedrunning. Um, and I was part of that big group that started speedrunning right after um, Sig Lemix big summer of, uh, of Super Mario 64 in August of 2013. So um, for people who don't know, maybe Sig Lemix uh, was, was doing 12-hour days every single day in August, doing speedruns of 120 star in Super Mario 64, trying to get the world record. It was... I think at the time held by a Japanese runner and Siglemic was like, you know, doing the big push for himself to bring it to the U S I guess was his mentality. And, um, I think there were a lot of people who watched a lot of that and thought I could do this too. I could, uh, learn my favorite game and speed run it and get good at it. And so in September of 2013, I fired up a Twitch stream and became a speed runner. And I started with super Mario world, my, my favorite game. I mm -hmm. started, I had played way too many hours of Super Mario World. It was a, a game that I grew up with and then replayed probably a million times all the way through that point in my life. And I figured I'm already pretty good at it. I should just keep playing it. And I learned a bunch of categories, made a ton of friends through speedruns live, doing races and getting into the community. Uh, the Super Mario World community has always been a, a really great, like actually close knit group of people who have been pretty good friends. So um, it was a good introduction and the rest as they say is history. <laughs> yeah, all starts with Mario World. Such a, it's a good game. The speed run is a, a speed run all right though. I it mean, is, it, uh, it's an popular. iconic game. It's iconic all right. Yeah. There's something about it. I don't know. It's really good. Like it's a, like a perfect starter speed run actually. Like 11 exit. Uh it's perfect. Yeah, I think I think so. I I often I mean I'm obviously biased because that's where I started, but I do think that Super Mario World is like the perfect introductory speed game for probably anyone. Uh it's got a number of categories to choose from, so you can really pick what length you want the speed run to be. Um, at, at least these days, it has a ton of great resources between the Super Mario World Wiki, um, the practice cart, um, a Discord server filled with people who want to help. And uh, it's just like a, a great first speed game, I think, for anyone because it's very easy to pick up and get started with. It's not a terribly difficult game, um, but getting very good at it is incredibly challenging. Oh, yeah. Top level Mario World is ridiculous, especially yeah, I think now. It's incomparable to a lot of a lot of other Mario games. Like Mario One has a lot of elements to it that are very challenging to just sort of casually beat quickly, right? Like mm -hmm. getting used to how to deal with Hammer Brothers, or getting used to some of the more difficult parts of the castle stages, or figuring out how to take the warp sufficiently if you're going to play any percent. Like there's a lot of pieces that just aren't trivial to put together for your first speed game and super mario brothers 3 i mean just playing that game at all quickly is difficult you know keeping run speed through an entire level is uh a, a, it's an art it, it takes a ton of work to be able to do um but super mario world's very different like with some exceptions there's a ton of it's really easy to just kind of put together a casual speed run. It's uh, obviously it's not the same as, you know, trying to play it at the highest level, but I think it is, it's very easy to pick up and just go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Again, it's perfect introductory to something because uh, it's just really straightforward. Like the movement just makes sense, but it, yeah, once you get into top level, there's just 
the game become the game becomes jank. It's kind of crazy just how much yeah. stuff you have to worry about there is in that game. It's almost like incredibly inconsistent too compared to yeah, it's a, most things. It's a difficult game to play at the highest level for that reason. You have to learn how to moderate those sorts of inconsistencies. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of games, uh, a lot of Mario games that have similar types of inconsistencies, but there's definitely a big line. Like, I think I think you can play Mario 1 perfectly. I think mm -hmm. in some ways you can play Mario 64 perfectly, but games like Mario 3 and Mario World, there's just a lot of pieces that are mostly out of your control, and the only real way to to get the perfect run is just the shotgun approach. You've just got to be willing to put in attempt after attempt after attempt to finally have all the all the dice rolls happen the way they need to. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's crazy to think about that. It Like just recently, the 11 exit uh, broke 940, sub 940. Yeah. And that's... Yeah, it's constantly getting pushed down. So much has to go right for that. Like not just execution. <laughs> that game, again, is just... Like, there's the zips with the blocks. Mm -hmm. Like, oh my gosh. I can't believe And all of those things are, like, manageable, but at yeah. the same time, uh, there's just as many elements that are kind of completely out of your control. Stuff that doesn't even show up in 11 Exit. You know, things like what, what specific frame you're doing an action on can make a huge difference. So, like, a Yoshi clip. Even, even if you do a perfect setup, has a 25% chance of failure every single time. Or uh, if you're going to spin your cape and run into an enemy, uh, you can kind of get frame ruled in some nasty ways and end up taking damage for it. Like Those sorts of things, you can certainly do things to manage that sort of inconsistency. But um, at the end of the day, you kind of have to just accept that if you're going to play at the highest level, you're going to lose some runs. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Actually, now that I think about it, I just like heard that even 96 exit was broken recently. Yeah, I can't remember who just recently broke it. I know it Usui has been pushing it down quite a lot lately. Pretty sure it was Maiba. Um, okay. If I'm remembering right. But yeah, I think it's, what, 12109 now? <laughs> yeah, it keeps going down. It's It's wild how fast that run just keeps getting lower and lower. Yeah, uh, because... Yeah, we're talking about 11 exit, which is like, yeah, but 96, so much of that is just absurd. And it's, an again, like almost an hour and a half long. Like, yeah, again, it's, it's just, Yoshi just clips. a week ago, 12109, yeah. Yeah, so you have to do two, is it two or three? I know you do two in like Forced Evolution. Are those the only like Yeah, two? so you have to Yoshi clip twice in Forced Evolution 2. You have to Yoshi clip one time in um, in chocolate. Uh, sorry, in Vanilla Dome too. So um, both of the, all of those stages kind of require you to use Yoshi to skip a large portion of it, um, and that's not even like the hardest parts of the run. Those oh, no. are just some of the bigger locations of inconsistency. Mm -hmm. Because again, yeah, twenty five percent chance just doesn't work. Too bad. So sad. <laughs> And that's only if your setup is correct. If you're doing yeah. the correct setup, it's a 25% chance of failure. If you aren't doing any particular setup and you're just kind of going for it, you know, it's kind of, you can kind of think of it like, um, like canonless in Super Mario 64. It's like, if you do the perfect sock folder setup, you have like a 50, 50 shot of succeeding. But if you do like OG canonless, uh, it's, it's honestly just rolling the dice, but at the end of the day, that setup takes time. So if you want to get the absolute best possible run, are you willing to just like lose 80, 90, 95% of your runs to trying to do something that doesn't waste two extra seconds? Hmm. Yeah. And again, in a run that that's, that's that long. <laughs> and like, yeah. that's at least the first illusion ones are so deep into it. Yeah, and that's actually been a big source of, like, um, one of the cool things about Super Mario World is that there's, I mean, I guess this comes up in, in a lot of other Mario games as well, but um, there's not, like, a fixed route. You can you can really choose your own route, especially with 96 Exit, where you have to do every single exit, and there's a lot of backtracking anyway, so you can modify the route to your tastes. And, like, we've, we've, ha we've seen runners in the past, like, design their own custom route just to try to get to inconsistent tricks earlier. I know Akisto 
uh, used to have a route where he would basically play No Star World, the No Star World route, <laughs> to get to Forced Evolution 2 as quickly as possible to try the Yoshi clips. And the rest of his route had to accommodate for all of those changes, but it was really just because he wanted to be able to get those resets out of the way as quickly as possible. That's interesting. Because, yeah, I generally see people just go around the normal way. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I know you have to backtrack because you go through the special world and then it puts you back at Yoshi's Island. So then you kind of go right. a second round through. But, yeah, that's interesting, actually. Yeah, basically, because you have to play Donut Plains on two different routes, uh, a lot of routes basically go through one route of Donut Plains then Star World and Special World so that you get dropped back off at Yoshi Island, then you do the other route of Donut Plains mm -hmm. um, in order to minimize that overworld movement, which, I mean, it's a small amount, but, you know, when you're vying for the top spot, um, that sort of thing can make a big difference. Yeah, and it works out, too, because, like, Vanilla Dome has the split path, and then that goes mm -hmm. all the way to, like, the fourth castle, even. Yep. So, yeah, it, it's... Weird how, like, almost perfectly that route works out that way. <laughs> it is very interesting. It, it's it's one of the more fun aspects of uh, doing Super Mario World is that so many different categories take entirely different routes. I mean, when you compare, like, the All Castles route versus 96 Exit, and 96 Exit probably has, at any given time, three different perfectly viable routes. And then there's even, like, 96 Co-op, which is a pretty... Um, it's less commonly run, but it is a, a pretty cool category um, where you play in two-player mode where there's two people moving around on the overworld and figuring out how to minimize that overworld movement is its own challenge. And, like, there's a lot of routing potential, like cool things you can come up with. What order do you do the levels? Are you trying to minimize overworld routing or are you trying to minimize or are you trying to optimize for, like, what power-ups you're going to have at a specific time? There's a lot of choices that go into it. And, I mean, I would I would say... 96 exit might be mostly solved these days though things do get changed occasionally uh but the jury's still out for a lot of categories you could you could make meaningful improvements to them perhaps hmm. that's really interesting how much routing plays a role in that like even i would assume like you'd think like routing would be a bigger factor in like again 96 but if like that's solved and shorter categories aren't that seems kind of backwards well, it's not so much that shorter categories aren't solved. It's that um, what levels you go through, um, you might be able to make use of certain things that, that haven't been approached with the category before. So like, mm. for instance, All Castles. Um, back when I was running All Castles actively, there was a pretty established route, and it actually got changed in order to uh, bring a Yoshi through a large section of the end game. Uh, so that you could have it in a level that you wouldn't otherwise. And different categories have different restrictions on them. So um, like what sort of tricks and glitches are and are not possible. And so, you know, as new things get discovered, which surprisingly for Super Mario World isn't all that uncommon, finding new clips that people either aren't willing to try uh, or just haven't perfected yet or, you know, occasionally someone discovers a new place that you can do a boss kill um, like where you spawn in a glitched boss and kill it to end the level early. Um, that sort of stuff is still, I would say, somewhat on the table. Um, I I never sort of put my finger down and say, all right, Super Mario World has been figured out in its entirety now. There's still, uh, every, every time I've thought, okay, this is probably the last thing that'll get really discovered, it always feels like, okay, well, the route just changed right out from under me. <laughs> yeah, that, that is crazy about that game. They're, it's so broken that there's just no way to know like how much you can do to that because 96 X already the... has like so many of those boss kills where you again spawn that glitched enemy i don't see it so much as super mario world being more broken it's just by virtue I, I think a large portion of it is that it's one of the most rom hacked games in existence um the code for it is so well documented and so well understood at this point that sometimes people just discover new ways to do things. Like if it weren't for that community, if it weren't for the amount of work that's been done to kind of understand that game better, we wouldn't have things like the credits warp or the cloud glitch, uh, because a lot of those aren't the sort of thing that you, by random happenstance, stumble upon. Those are the sorts of things that come from like dedicated analysis of the code and specifically setting things up in very, very 
particular ways. Um, and none of that would have been possible if it weren't for the fact that there's this whole separate world away from speedrunning, away from tassing, who just understand Super Mario World on just an absurdly nuanced level. Um, people pour over the code to make modifications all the time, and sometimes it just highlights, oh, you know, there's this weird interaction here, and I wonder if there's some way we can exploit that. Mm -hmm. I've never thought of it that way. Yeah, because I always hear, like, oh, Mario World's just so broken because you can do all this arbitrary code execution stuff, and there's so few games where you can, like, really take it to the level that Mario World is at. But yeah, it's like, well, how did it get that way? I've never right. thought I've never thought of it that way. Yeah, I I imagine I mean I, obviously wild speculation, um, and there's certainly properties of Super Mario World that make it more um, capable of being broken, like certain choices, and and you could definitely point those and say, well, that's that's a sign of a game that has real potential for breaking. Um, but you know, it's hard to compare that against a game like. Super Mario 64, where most of the modifications that have ever been made are just changing level geometry out from under it. Or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a game like Super Mario Brothers 3, which the most people have is like a tile editor. People haven't really completely dissected those games at the same level. Mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe those games are equally as broken. It's hard to say. Yeah, it's really, like, impossible to know until someone's like, I understand what every bit of this code does. Right. And Mario World is pretty much like that, which is yeah. funny to think about. Yeah, we have we have decompilations of it. We have uh, annotated assembly uh, dumps for Super Mario World. And then on top of that, you know, you have hundreds, if not maybe thousands of people who have all individually written their own modifications and patches for the, the ROM hacking community. So, like, it's just, it's a game that I think is perhaps better understood than any other retro game um it just it's so well documented so well detailed so well understood that it's hard to compare it side by side with anything else mm -hmm. yeah definitely it yeah if you look at like the rum hacking scene for it it's wildly massive compared mm -hmm. to i the only other game that's like that is mario 64 but even like mario 64 things doesn't have like the level of custom stuff that right. Mario World would have. I mean, SM64 in its own right is really coming along these it days. Is. Now that there's a decomp for it, I think I think we're going to start seeing Super Mario 64 stepping into its heyday, just like Super Mario World's been having for 10 plus years. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Super Mario 64 is about to have a similar explosion now. Uh, but yeah, at this point, I don't think any other game can match it. Yeah, probably not. But uh, if you could, though so many games would have it'd be wild yeah just absolutely yeah i mean so mario world has mario world central which is where all of that stuff is from and now yeah mario 64 has their own rom right and that's massive too and i mean you have people like k's pushing custom stuff and even like optimize optimizing the code itself to like make the game run better right so. I would say I would say K's is on the level of understanding um, that the broader Super Mario World ROM hacking scene already is like mm -hmm. I think I think he's probably got a similar depth of knowledge. The question is just like whether or not he identifies things in there that would be helpful to speedrunners. Yeah, like obviously the people that make all this stuff just want to make like cool ROM hacks for people to play. It's completely different to like use that code to like try to interpret what could be beneficial in other methods right i guess and i mean mario 64 is in the weird case where it just doesn't seem like it could have something like that but i don't know yeah i think a lot of uh, a lot of super mario world's most broken stuff just comes from the fact that um just comes from some weird side effects about how it can run its code like the fact that there's certain ways to kind of jump into specific areas of memory that allow you to set up your own code and that i mean that that is not something that you can always come up with in just any game it's not like every game just has untapped potential for arbitrary code execution you know maybe super mario 64 just doesn't have an easy route to that mm -hmm. so 
Yeah, Mario World's lucky in that instance where it's, again, so well understood how to trigger it, where you can almost like just trigger it anywhere <laughs> at this point. Yeah. Yeah, it, b basically the secret sauce is if there's a charge and chuck, you have potential. <laughs> yeah. Um, because the charge and chuck is like the 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 linchpin. It's the it's the it's that keystone in the whole process that <laughs> that holds it all together. Um, because charge and chuck isn't supposed to be able to be eaten by Yoshi, but there's a trick for Yoshi to be able to eat anything, and then charge and chuck like has a lookup table for what he's supposed to do, or like. Power ups have a lookup table for what they're supposed to do when they get eaten, but Charge and Chuck has that flag set in a specific way that jumps to a very specific location that just happens to be very exploitable. Um, <laughs> and like all of those things had to fall in line in exactly the right way. It's not that Super Mario World is just particularly more broken because all of these things are things that the programmers tried to prevent, but it just so happens that if you put three or four different glitches in the right order together, uh, it just produces more or less magic, so. Yeah. And I mean, you see the things people make with that, like someone mm -hmm. put Mario 1 in Mario World yeah. in, in, just in Yoshi's Island 2. It's like, all right, there it is. You can, once you have access to that, you can like create anything because it's just, you have code at your disposal now. Just make whatever yeah. the game can, the console can run. If you're capable of running arbitrary code, you can just start making it store whatever data you want and save RAM and then make it jump to that location and you get to run all of the code that you wrote. It's <laughs> a tedious process, but I mean, it if you've got more time results. than sense, you can do whatever. Yeah, quite literally. And I mean, there's such a big mainstay at the GDQ, like TaskBot stuff. Yeah. And just. Uh, it's just so cool to watch because even like Mario 3, I mean, that again has a completely exploitable thing. And there was that one famous Mario 3 ace test that's just crazy. But even that, like the only known way that, at least from what I've seen, is that 7-1, you hit that block, set up the Koopas in certain ways or whatever. But yeah, right. you, Mario World, again, any level with that Chuck, just have fun. Yeah. <laughs> there you go spawn the spawn a boss and kill it and beat the stage early in like so many levels or like yep and then that Spawning game also has the it's very similar yeah yeah and then that game also has like the block duplication which is like it's a whole other thing of crazy bullshit yeah the block duplication is a a weird side effect of of how its engine runs i mean i i tend to be very gracious towards glitches in games i mean i understand that every game gets to market through a series of compromises mm -hmm, if of if every dev had a year two years more to work on things maybe they'd all get fixed but like it's like a weird side effect of the way the 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 block flipping animation works that you can even make new blocks and that's that doesn't break anything it doesn't break anything that you can duplicate a block but if you combine that with like three or four other things once again mm -hmm. uh it it breaks stuff so like being able to spawn yoshi wings in a level is not just block duplication it's block duplication but duplicating the block specifically over a yoshi coin and then the code that makes the two halves of the yoshi coin be connected gets broken when you disrupt that and so it replaces the block with a different type of block accidentally and it just happens to be one that can have yoshi wings in it so like once again it's like you have to combine three or four different glitches together and that only happens when you kind of understand what's happening under the hood <laughs> oh that game is so crazy <laughs> it is it's wild that so much is possible in it but um it does make the run very fun to do uh, mm -hmm. It can be frustrating because it has some some challenging or inconsistent parts to it, but it's a very satisfying game to play well. Yeah, and it's just like a showcase to mm -hmm. anyone because any casual person, like even people that like know the game really well, aren't going to know what the fuck you're doing. Yeah, exactly. It's crazy. Uh, like, it takes like you know ISO freezes videos that like go in high detail and ice watch like an hour-long video i come out i still don't know what's going on like it's so wildly complex but you, sure. all that matters is you can just do it as long as you know how to do it you can do it yeah you don't have to be an expert in order to be able to do the run i mean if, if no. someone were like well i kind of want to do the run but i don't want to have to learn you know assembly code or something like that but like 
you don't have to know it if you understand how it's been reproduced, but discovering new stuff in Super Mario World at this point is really more often than not the side effect of a lot of people who do have that really nuanced understanding of the game. Mm -hmm. I can only imagine if you had to learn assembly to run Mario World at a top level. That'd be funny. Yeah. That would be I mean, if you're going to do Credit Warp, you kind of need to learn at least assembly by proxy, right? Because you have to stomp <laughs> the Koopas at the exact right locations. Maybe, maybe that's not assembly code, but you have to... Yeah, that, that's something you could, like, replicate without knowing what you're doing, though. Sure. I think. But, yeah, I mean, that is kind of what you're doing, I guess. Yeah, even that's, like... I remember, what, the first completion, like, credits warp was still, like, four or five minutes, and now it's, like, 40 seconds. Yeah, I think the very first one was uh, Jeff P. a long time ago. Uh, Jeff Sledge. And... Mm -hmm. um. At the time, if I remember correctly, uh, Jeff had demonstrated this was possible and people didn't believe it at first. They they thought, like he had, Jeff Sledge, uh, he, he wasn't like an active Super Mario World runner. He was just kind of demonstrating an idea and he fired up his stream and he demonstrated it and that was pretty much it. He like wasn't talking through the run he wasn't explaining how it was discovered or anything like that he just kind of showed it off and a lot of people were like oh this was like it must have been modified there's no way that that's possible um and it wasn't until much later if i'm not mistaken i want to say it was uh between dots and seth bling that they kind of like worked out how it happened how it worked um, maybe they talked to him. Maybe he was part of the process. I, I don't remember the specifics anymore. It's been so long. Mm -hmm. uh, but like they they were kind of like, no, actually, this is legitimate. Like we figured out how it works. We we know how it works. We can we can reproduce it at this point. But for there was a little period of time where he had showed it off and everyone was very dismissive and it's like, I can't be real. That doesn't make any sense. Why, mm -hmm. you know, you jump here, you jump there, you put an enemy in this spot and then you go over here and suddenly credits roll. And it's very suspicious because like I said before, Super Mario World has one of the most active ROM hacking communities. It would not be very hard to just make a ROM hack where you push a button and you push another button and it rolls credits. Mm -hmm. So um, that would have been a much easier route to get there. And now, Jeff Sledge is a, a a legitimate runner. He's a he's the sort of guy who um, you definitely want to believe because he's. But it just seemed so outlandish. It seems so unbelievable that you're sitting in YI two doing nonsense and then suddenly credits roll. Um, but you know we've come a long way since then, I suppose. Yeah, I know that a uh, Seth Bling was the first to do it on like a console with the original cartridge and everything. Mm -hmm. So then it was like, oh okay. I mean, there's no faking that one. <laughs> there, right. There it yep. is. It also becomes, I mean, you know, you can fake it twice, but like the <laughs> thing is, it's like once you have like two people seemingly unrelated demonstrating the same thing in two different ways, it starts to, you start to say, okay, maybe this isn't fake anymore. Maybe that we're yeah. onto something here. And, <laughs> you know, Seth Bling, you know, definitely much more familiar to everyone at that point as being like this huge Minecraft YouTuber. He wasn't a Super Mario World player. He was, you know, mm -hmm. a million subs on YouTube playing Minecraft. Like, he's not the sort of person who you think would burn his reputation by faking something and lying, which, mm -hmm. I mean, for better or for worse, that does lend an air of credence to to claims. If, you, if you're a person with a reputation and something to lose and you say, nope, this is real, you tend to believe that a little more that maybe isn't always good that we uh, yeah. lend authority just to... Oh. There it is. The classic. Let me see if I can switch to my other connection. So yeah, that was the internet thing. Are we still out? Oh, there we go. So yeah. Hello. There yeah, hello. There there it was. I, I did warn about this. <laughs> Spectrum at its finest. Oh, is it still not working, actually? Oh wow. Alright, hold on. 
This is a bad outage. Usually it only goes out for like five seconds. This is like... We have bad weather? No. Um... <laughs> We live again? I don't know what's going on. It looks like the stream's back on, but I, I've like lost my connection to Discord. <laughs> oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, hello. Hello? Okay. <laughs> that was a bad You're crash. Back. All right. <laughs> Uh, anyway. That's what I get for hoping that we don't have any outages, as I made it worse. No, I mean, again, this is just commonplace, so everyone should be used to it. But I will say that was, like, pretty bad. I'm wondering, I'm, like, looking outside to see if the weather's bad or something. I'm like, damn, that, that went out a while. I don't know what it is, because, like, I'll drop zero frames and it's just out. And it'll just come back in and zero frames drop. And it's like, okay. It's all right. You go when you feel like it. But anyway, uh, the last, where were we? I, sh I got distracted by internet outage. I forgot. I know what we were, uh, talking, we were about. talking about. We were talking about Seth Bling being yeah. legitimate and and how uh, reputations and stuff being <laughs> being popular lends you authority. Yeah, a little bit. Sometimes. 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 But I mean. Yeah, I've never cared too much about Minecraft, but the Mario World stuff. And I mean, it's not even just Mario World that he does anymore. Um, I know last year he did the uh, all four, or I mm -hmm. guess technically all five, because Mario World yeah. is part of it. But uh, I know it pretty well because I was player three. There you go. I had to yeah, hold I, uh... very uncomfortable button combinations for multiple minutes. <laughs> like what was it I, I think i have it like burned in my memory it was like i don't know like a y select down left or something so i just had like my fingers painfully gripping this controller for two minutes straight or something it, and you don't want to fuck it up because if you even release for like one second like something in the code is now wrong and the whole thing doesn't work there's high Ace stakes is, Ace is crazy. can't mess that up <laughs> that's the moral to the story ace is crazy yeah, Seth Bling definitely went down the rabbit hole of a uh, uh, of a fascination and infatuation with uh with retro game hacking. I, is that even the right word? <laughs> hacking. Yeah, like uh, exploitation is maybe better. Exploit. I like exploitation. Let's go with that. Don't clip that out of context, but. <laughs> Seth Bling loves exploitation. <laughs> okay, hold on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, but yeah, Mario World. Well, well, it, it's it's over. It's been clipped out of context. Well, so yeah, Mario World's crazy game. Yeah. All in all. <laughs> it's the game that keeps me coming back. Um... <laughs> the game that keeps on giving. Yeah, I I keep thinking I've I've gotten out of it, and then I don't play it for a few years, and I get roped back into playing it again. <laughs> As it is right now, I'm like, I think I might do some 96 exit runs once again. I uh, I was talking with a friend about it a few weeks ago, and it's like, man, I'm itching for it again. Mm. What's your PB in that again? Uh, 124. That's pretty good. <laughs> it's okay. These days, the strats are so advanced that 124 is, uh, it's fairly out of date. I should probably improve Sure, that. but, I don't know. Again, I guess you have to get in the mindset of for the time. Like, yeah. definitely. Like, I remember, like, 122 era. Yeah, so. there was a long time where uh, 123, 25 was the world record. I don't remember. Um, I just remember... The world record hovering around that area for a very long time before so many wild tricks got added to the run. I mean, I remember the the huge rush when all of the boss kills got added. I um, feel like there was a big, uh, what do you want to call it, shift change where, you know, all the old runners were like, I don't want to do these. And then a whole bunch of new runners were like, well, we will. And so, like, the, the changing of the guard 
um, mm-hmm. with with a whole bunch of people swapping places, passing the baton. Yeah, I mean that's what happens with any good speedrun community, right? Like mm-hmm. if if the old hats keep the world record forever, I can get a little bit stale. I don't think that that's always true. I mean, there's there's definitely games where the old hats just keep coming back and keep pushing it down themselves. But it's nice when new blood comes in and keeps the community alive. Yeah, there's always going to be someone that comes in and does something. I, yeah. I think that's the what speedrunning has taught me is that just people care no matter what you think. Something's going to happen. I mean, even with Super Mario World, Maiba's not new. Maiba's been running yeah. for probably as long as I have. Maybe maybe a little less, but um, a lot of the runners that I see... Now, granted, it's a little bit unfair to me. I'm, I'm, I have Western bias because I don't recognize a lot of Japanese runners' names sometimes because they their community tends to, to separate a little bit from ours. Um, so I can't necessarily speak to them all being new runners, but it is nice to see our leaderboards filled with new names, at least. I'll say that mm-hmm. much. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say, like, I've seen a lot of new names, but, I mean, I, that's to me. Like, they could have been there for years, right. and they were just lower. Like, Usui or... came seemingly out of nowhere. I, I didn't know of Usui before, basically, he topped the leaderboard. <laughs> um, Maiba I've known of for a very long yes. time. Maiba's been running in Super Mario World Sword. In, in even the Western circles for at least six years. I mean, I remember doing tournaments and Maiva participating in those tournaments a long time ago. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's definitely new runners. And um, I think I think things are improving in the sense that uh, for a very long time, there was definitely like a Western speed rain scene and a Japanese speed rain scene or, you know, outside of the West in general. Um, and I feel like, maybe we're doing better with outreach and crossover, at least from my perspective. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of nice to see. Yeah. As time has gone on, it's definitely like merged just in general, because I mean, the Japanese community, like Japanese and like us were like the two biggest, like speedrunning communities, unless you count yep. like all of Europe or something, but like they were so disconnected for so long. Because it's not like till like ten years later you're like, oh, the entire like world record of history we knew of is wrong. Yeah, oh, that's true. <laughs> so it's it's nice yeah. to like merge that all together. It just makes everything so much easier. And, right. And now it's just the whole world is doing something. <laughs> yeah, there's a few speedrun communities who themselves have kept up with um, like runners worldwide better. You know, Super Mario sixty four has always had a really good handle on what what the best runners are worldwide. I think Mm -hmm. for the last more than 10 years, you know, there's no question of whether or not, like maybe we don't know about a Japanese runner. Maybe we don't know of someone in Asia. Maybe we don't know of someone in Europe. Um, Mm -hmm. They've, they've had a pretty good handle on it the whole time, but you know, Super Mario world hasn't done a great job with that historically. Um, Not, not to like blame us slash them for that, but like, it's it's hard to keep up with especially when the two communities don't communicate so yeah definitely and yeah that, that's something i've like i've enjoyed seeing over time is that better merge to better get a handle of the information like right. accurate information because i mean i got into speed running because i thought the history behind it was cool so sure. it's nice to have an accurate history so you're like oh there it is <laughs> so yeah and yeah, it, like even like Brazil now is like huge in speed running. Yeah. Maybe they always were, but again, you wouldn't have known that like 10 years ago. Right. So. Yeah. And it's tough. I, um, it's tough to compare directly anyway, because, you know, like Brazil is often running on PAL consoles. So mm-hmm. at least for retro games, that can sometimes be hard to compare directly. So even if you do have a history of runners from Brazil, maybe they're not directly comparable for whatever reason. And so that's tough to handle. Um, obviously the language barrier is always going to be an issue no matter what. Um, but yeah, Brazil has a big, uh, Super Mario World scene, at least I know that Mm. much. I don't know about every game. I didn't know it was big into Mario World. I just knew in, Mm -hmm. in general, I've been seeing a lot more from that area. Sure. More of the public, but yeah, that's another thing like PAL and NTSC differences. Cause I'm sure like PAL Mario World, does it play like a lot differently? Uh, you couldn't compare their times directly uh, yeah. just because of some differences between it. Like uh, 
the way that you fly on the PAL version of Super Mario World is very different. The game does run at a slightly different speed. Um, there's mm -hmm. just like a lot of little things that end up making them tough to compare. There's no like, there's no like time you can apply. You know, you can't just like multiply the thing by, by six bits or something like that. Yeah, get yeah. the correct time. It's just very, very slightly different in the way that it runs. Mm -hmm. Like it took us a while. It took until I finally did it like a year ago, whatever, but finally separating Mario one for NTSC and pal, <laughs> because they're just, well, I, I guess that game's weird because it is so much different. So, like, Pal. Pal SMB1 is just completely it's different. Com completely. Really? Yeah, completely different. So how does, how does it behave differently? Um, you jump a lot higher. You can do full flagpole glitch on any flagpole. Oh, wow. wow. Yeah, so, like, it's just... Mike is messed up. Uh-oh. It sounds... Sound good to you. It sounds good to me, but... I don't know. Uh, maybe Blaze it can give me more information, and then I could try to fix whatever that problem is. It sounds That's fine to me. me. Yeah, it's all glitched out, like on OBS. Yeah, yeah, it does, does have a robotic logging mode on OBS. I just listened. Interesting. That's that's a new one. Well, um, how do I go about that? Because that means yeah, the recording's now screwed up unfortunate yeah it sounds fine to it's me still, so it's still understandable it's just, uh, still understandable it yeah just has, has some in it. yeah i'd like to fix that though but i don't yeah, know yeah. i don't know what the problem is because i've never had this problem before um i can try turning it off and on again uh where oh now it's not even showing up fascinating Best new tech problem unlocked. Um, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that actually. I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave and rejoin the Discord call for anyone who couldn't hear that. Okay, and. Hello. All right, let's try now. Um, maybe this is better. Maybe. W we'll see. <laughs> yeah, I've I've never had like a microphone issue before, so this is this is new. This is new problem. So hopefully it's just fixed now. Um, I restarted Discord and like restarted the volume property, so we can only hope. Um, anyway, where were we? Uh, you were telling me about PAL SMB1. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that... Because I know, like, I think Mario Kart 64, like, is pretty much exactly the same. It, it's just, like, timer runs differently, so you can compare it. So I, I wasn't sure, because every game's different. Like, again, Mario right. 1's always my example, because it is so different. <laughs> like, I don't know why we ever combine them. Like, I think the task for PAL is, like, 452 or 451 or something. Like no no nah. they need to they need to be different <laughs> at right. least in, at least in that game so right. I, I was just curious because pal is not your pal as i say so <laughs> it, it's interesting but yeah i um i ran a bunch of games more than just uh oh yeah super mario world that's only been a taste of what i've gotten up to yeah would you say that that game's like the one you put the most time into Probably I've um I've definitely put more time into that than so I would say that my second game I put the most time into was A Link to the Past and I mm. I definitely think Super Mario World got more of my time so yeah I think I think Super Mario World's up there yeah I I know nothing about A Link to the Past actually my entire like I, I don't play Zelda games at least not yet I I will someday but so, the only thing I know about A Link to the Past is. Um, last year, I went to one of Grand Pooh Bear's events that he runs, mm -hmm. and uh, Andy was there, and he did like a glitched run of it. It was still like an hour or something, so it wasn't right. like glitch your way to the credits. I know it has its own glitch your way to the end thing, but I don't know what was going on, but the screen was flashing all kinds of colors. 
it yeah, is, uh, is pretty uh, wild. In the past in particular, its glitch runs are pretty pretty strange. Um, those games are uh, definitely designed in such a way to take real good advantage of the limited amount of space that's on those cartridges. And so mm. it... I mean, like I said, you know, every game is a, a product of compromises. And so, you know, you can take advantage of those sorts of things. You know, every single dungeon is on the same map. And so if oh, you just yeah. walk through walls, you can get from one dungeon to the other. And that opens the door for, like, really interesting glitched runs if you know how to do that. And that's not even the most interesting type of glitch in mm -hmm. A Link to the Past. There's a ton of interesting stuff, so. Yeah, I mean... Did you run a lot of the glitch categories in that game? No. Oh, you were a glitchless, glitchless yep, gamer. I just ran, uh, just ran a link to the past. No major glitches. Fair that enough. That was the only category I ever did. I I spent a lot of time on it. I I practiced a lot, did a ton of runs, um, but uh, never really got outside of just that one category. Mm -hmm. So, as someone who like knows next to nothing, what's so interesting about that speed run? Uh, so. I mean, it's tough to say. I mean, I think a lot of it's propped up by nostalgia, but like, I think the game is very interesting by uh, virtue of how optimized you can be. You know, like you think about uh, the way that Super Metroid runners think about individual rooms in Super Metroid. You can really take the same look at A Link to the Past. Every individual room you can optimize entirely. Um, there's a ton of flexibility in the route you can choose uh, whether to pick up safeties, what order to do things in based on your own comfort. Um, that's not a situation of like, there's a lot of viable routes. The fastest route is going to be the fastest route. Uh, but it's a it's an interesting first speed game because you can start with a lot of safe options and like slowly drop them as you get better at the game. Um, it's got a lot of little techniques that make it fun, a lot of little uh, glitches and, and speed tricks you can do, things like, um, you know, super speed by uh, doing certain inputs, like against stairs or, or things like that. Um, and the glitch categories themselves are just completely unhinged, being able <laughs> to go through walls, glitched items, the ways that you use different items to either get out of bounds or produce weird side effects. I mean, I feel like it rivals Super Mario World in some ways. Um, hmm. But yeah, I, I think I think for me, it's just a game that I loved from my childhood. It's one of the games I played the most of growing up. And so uh, it, it's just one of those games that, you know, a lot of speedrunners have a game that they loved from their childhood that they wanted to, to, to finally best it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I did that. Yep. That, I mean, Mario One was the first game I ever played and beat, so makes makes sense. That that's like the. I feel like if you're gonna get into speedrunning, like start with a game that you love, and then yeah, th that'll. Well, that's I mean, like it has to be a game that it. you really, really love, even during the worst of times, because there's gonna <laughs> be the worst of times. Oh yeah, um, of course. But like my my giant repertoire of speedrunning really started from that mentality of like games that I played as a kid that I couldn't beat, that I wasn't very good at. And I was like, well, now that I'm an adult and I can practice and I'm, I'm trying this new speed running thing, I can learn them. I can mm -hmm. finally beat them. I can be as good at them as I've always wanted to be. Uh, and I think that that was a really fun approach to starting speed running. Like the, the second game I ever spe uh, speed ran was a game called Kiwi Craze for the NES. You mm -hmm. may not be familiar with it. It's a, obscure taito platformer um but it's very hard it's an extremely difficult game and i could never get very far as a kid and so that was like the second speed run i ever did i was just like all right if i'm if i'm gonna start playing more than just super mario world i'm gonna go back and get good at all these games that that made me feel foolish as a kid there you go showing your younger self what was inside all along i guess there you go that's what matters and yeah so that went from two games to what like 500 what are we at now uh i think i have um slightly over 200 individual runs or unique Oof. runs yeah wow these days i mean there's there's plenty of, i mean at the time when i was like actively 
because I went through a period of time where I like was challenging myself to learn more games. I I had gotten this reputation of being the guy who speedruns all sorts of games. I was like, all right, let's run with that. Like, if I'm mm-hmm. going to be a streamer and I want people to like be entertained, like maybe it'd be entertaining if my specific niche was I just run every game. And so I started this this project. I called it the Most Games Project because at the time, speedrun.com had a page you could go to that would show a list of users and how many games they've run. And you could sort that list based on the number of games. I I wanted to be at the top of that list. And so I like made a a project for myself where I would learn like, you know, one, two, three new games per week. And like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't just like do a playthrough with a timer. I would, I would actually practice them and I would try to get good at them. But I also wasn't obviously spending a lot of time with each one of them. Mm -hmm. I would, I'd probably give each one, you could think of it like a miniature 12 hour challenge for every single game, right? Like I would, Mm -hmm. I would study it. I would route it. I would figure it out. Then I would put up a few times to get a time that I was happy with and I'd move on to the next one. Uh, And that's what finally got me over like 200. Um, Eventually I ended up stopping that project because you really can't compete with so everyone can speed run however they want to. There's mm-hmm. no rules about how you speed run. But I was I was deciding this challenge based on a metric on speedrun.com where not everyone had the same viewpoint as I did on how you speed run, right? So like yeah. there were a lot of people who would do 20 different flash games every week and would just throw them on speedrun.com and that's perfectly fine but like it became this thing where i was getting frustrated like how dare that person upload this run it's not very good and it's like that's that's so toxic i have to stop this <laughs> damn so toxic yeah but yeah so but, but I, mean, I you were I learned pretty high a ton up of there cool games <laughs> yeah yeah i i think at my peak i was like second or third on that list um and you know, I learned a bunch of cool games in the process. I learned about a bunch of cool games in the process. It became this thing where I would just like search through Tass Video to find games I had never seen before. Or I would look through uh, obscure lists of Famicom platformers to find ones <laughs> I'd never heard of before. And I I learned a ton of games and learned about a ton of games. I, I am pleased now that I feel so knowledgeable. I feel like I, I'm aware of so many more games than the average person. So I think overall it was a good exercise for me, um, but eventually I I had to I had to stop trying to speed run everything. <laughs> That's fair, but I mean, all right. So what were some highlights? Um, I guess like so like what were some of my favorite runs I ever did? Yeah, it was part of that. Um, so the very first twelve hour challenge I taught myself. Or I learned The Hobbit for the GameCube. Um, I still contend that that's probably one of the greatest uh, underrated speed games of all time. Is that the like game more... that has like that big history that everyone talks about on YouTube? Yes, that one oh, did okay. get a big history video much later from M Karma. Okay. Um, yeah, that that is that game. Um, it is. I guess I guess these days now that it got a little bit of attention on YouTube, uh, maybe it's a little less underrated. But uh, I still think. There are a lot of people who would maybe enjoy learning that game who who should pick it up. Um, it's a super good speed game. Um, I mean, I, I can think of a bunch of games I ran over that time. Um, I ran Shrek Extra Large uh, for the GameCube, <laughs> nice. which is also a surprisingly good speed game. One that I didn't expect to be as good as it is, but it's got like really sick movement and it's a ton of fun to play. Um, And I think doing that also kind of introduced me to what is now, I would say, probably more of my passion, which is like bad games. (laughs) So in the process, you know, I played a bunch of games that were either, um, I think it probably started more with getting into playing like these Taiwanese bootlegs, (laughs) Um, just very interesting, broken, janky games. And I found it very fascinating to play them and you know, whereas the average person would put it down immediately because they're frustrating and challenging, I, I found it very satisfying to try to, like, make sense of it and try to actually get good at controlling those games. And that led me into probably more mainstream, quote-unquote, bad games. And, uh, you know, I, I was able to apply that uh, quite a few times to runs at, like, GDQs. So I've done a handful of games for the Awful Block, 
uh, over the years. Um, I guess aside from that, um, my other real big passion in speedrunning was uh, co-op games. I really loved speedrun co-op games. Me and my partner, uh, Skybills, uh, lived together and we tried to take advantage of the fact that we've got two speedrunners living under the same roof. Why do we not speedrun games together? So we learned a bunch of really cool co-op games like Lord of the Rings Return of the King is a really cool co-op speed game with some really cool stuff in it. Um, we played uh, Cookie and Cream for the PlayStation 2, PlayStation, PlayStation 2, uh, which is one of FromSoft's earlier games before they got into that whole like Dark Souls thing. Hmm. Um but these these uh, cute, fun little platformers. We played all sorts of co-op games together. Sky and I, for a while, had the co-op 96 Exit, Super Mario World 96 Exit uh, world record, um, which now no longer is even an impressive run compared to how far that category ended up going. Um, but, you know, we were we were the only, the only shop in town doing it. So, uh, of course, we had the world record. As long as you have it once, that's all that matters. That's that's all that matters. I get to say former world record holder. Exactly. Which is in many ways actually more prestigious than being the current world record holder. Yeah. I'm going to start thinking that way. <laughs> That'll make me feel better. Yeah. I hope that helps. Yes. I, I'm, I'm more impressive than the current stuff. Take that. Yeah. It's a good, that'll be a good mindset for me. But yeah. Um since you brought up Awful Block, um, in case people don't know, yeah, GDQ has like a part of the schedule lined up for just shitty games. Usually like at night. It, it's it's a good time. <laughs> yeah. And I was gonna say you're like a you're like a staple there. You every year there's either a run by you, you're on the couch or something. There was a period of time where I was basically on half the couches for Awful Block <laughs> doing a run of my own. Um, I'm definitely much less pivotal to Awful Block these days. Um, there's there's all sorts of new faces who are bringing in brand new games, which is awesome. I mean, you know, people like Brisencia running his Cusa Grande tournament have done a huge amount to sort of like make people excited about the idea of bad games, which, I mean, you know, depending on your perspective, that might seem like a silly endeavor to try to make people excited about bad games, but there's really a lot to love about playing these weird, unusual games and trying to, like, make sense and make cool speedruns out of them. Um, and, you know, that's brought, you know, each of those tournaments has hundreds of people in them these days. They're, they've mm. grown massively. Um, it's actually a pretty big community of bad games appreciators. Um, and that has impacted Awful Block. There's a, a lot of now uh, people who maybe weren't even into speedrunning before who have found their footing and found something that they really love and sharing. And I think that's great. So, hmm. yeah, I might have been the king of Awful Block <laughs> four or five years ago. Uh, but these days, I might be on one couch and that's about it, which is great. I love seeing so many new people picking up the torch and, and making it special. Yeah. But, you know, that's the dream is one day we're just going to have one whole day of awful block in GDQ mm. where we're expanding. Or just like a whole separate event. Awful games done quick. We in need GDQ. That. Just, just rename it. There you go. Just that's what, it... that's what awful block was called in the old days. It was called awful games done quick. Oh, and perfect. the, the block during, uh, SGDQ was called silly games done quick. Mm, um, perfect. Which, which wasn't a block of bad games so much as it was kind of like um, weird ass just games. Yeah, just strange games. Yeah. Makes sense. G GDQ used to have a lot of like cool blocks like that, right? Like mm -hmm. I remember when I first started watching GDQ, they had like the WTF Japan block, which would just be like <laughs> quirky Japanese games, and then they'd have silly block. And now most of those blocks have more or less dried up, and all that's left is awful block because they can't yeah. kill us. We're like a mm -hmm. weed. Very nice. Uh, that that's how I describe that. I don't know. Um, yeah, I wasn't around when they had all the like. Obviously, I've seen the awful blocks because they're still there. But yeah, like sometimes they'll try to put the last block. I really remember is like SGT twenty eighteen definitely had like a Mario block, and they'll usually like mm -hmm. put the Mario games together or the Sonic games together. But I didn't know about like 
the silly block for summer. I knew about like the awful yeah. block. I didn't. I've never heard of what the fuck are Japan or whatever. Yeah, the, the block is literally news. called the WTF Japan block. That is news. Now, wow. I think this was in um, maybe around 2014, 2015. The yeah. first GDQ I ever went to was 2015. Um, so I think it was right around that era was yeah. with the WTF Japan block. Yeah, first I went to was 2018. So, and I didn't start watching probably until then either. Um, sure. The, the only GDQ event that happened from my start to the one I went to was AGDQ 2018, and I didn't really watch that yet. So yeah, so many speedrunners have these stories of like falling in love with speedrunning from watching classic games done quick and the old GDQs mm -hmm. and. I just, I, I had never watched them. I don't know if I just wasn't yeah. aware of them or I wasn't interested in them. And it was specifically Sig Lemix, Summer mm -hmm. of SM64 that brought me into it. I mean, SM64 is also one of those games I grew up on and I played a million hours of. So it was a good gateway for me. Yeah. I, I've had so many people on here talk about like, yeah, the classic game Stunt Quick is like, oh, that's what got me started. And it's weird because I did not know what speedrunning was until 2017 where i randomly stumbled upon a summoning salt video like i just yeah. no clue never heard of gdq i didn't even have a twitch account i didn't watch live streams like i just didn't and so when i found out about twitch and i was like oh like okay i get why watching streams is fun now like tv but interactive and it's like more tailored content to what you want i didn't realize like speed running like made help make twitch what it is even like they grew together like sure. Siglemic was pulling in like five digit viewers on those streams like jesus what was going on and in that era that's unheard of i mean these yeah, days the top streamers unheard. are definitely pulling those numbers in but like Siglemic was number one and it wasn't close um <laughs> no that that summer in particular he absolutely blew up you know uh games media were were printing articles about what he was doing like it was it's an indescribable time for people who damn it it's going off again <sighs> apologies to the youtubers or the youtube watchers Oh, and Twitch, I guess, but they can't hear me right now. All right, we're going to try it this way. Okay. Hello? Hello. Hi. It is being awfully bad today. Kind of like the alpha block. <laughs> All right. Um, we'll see how this goes. It, stream hasn't come back online yet. Oh, I'll type in my usual command, though. See, I, I'm prepared now. Just type in simple command. There you go. It looks like it's back now. Yeah, I think so. Yep. All caps. My internet is dog shit. I'm sorry for the crashes. Classic. <laughs> that used to be in my title. I guess I should add it back. <laughs> but, all right. Hopefully it didn't, like, screw up the audio again. Uh, if someone wants to let me know if it is or not. Because, again, it sounds fine to me, but I can't hear it through OBS. So, anyway, right. um... So, once again, trying to figure out where we were. Yeah, so uh, I was talking about how um, that, that period of time with Siglemic running Super Mario 64 is like, it's hard to understand for people who weren't there at the time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're kind of used to now whenever like a very, very popular game gets a new world record by a very, very popular runner. And like Kotaku will print like a three paragraph article about it and say, mm -hmm. this person broke the world record. Uh, but like at the time, that was definitely not happening. And I don't know what it was, but like Siglimic gained as much attention as he was sort of fed into itself because, you know, once people are paying attention to that that much, games media has to report on it. They mm -hmm. Or they feel like they need to report on it. And the reporting just made it bigger. 
So, yeah. you know, every single stream, he'd have another thousand viewers or something like that. <laughs> and he was streaming for 30 days straight, 12 hours a day, if not more. Um, it was just a while. It's like, it's hard to describe how that was. I mean, I remember I was in grad school at the time and I would be sitting in my research lab, work on one monitor, Siglimic on the other. And then when Siglimic would cut for the day, I would like be texting my friend like, hey, did you, were you watching today? Like, did you see the runs today? Like, <laughs> and I wasn't a Twitch watcher. I, I wasn't big into it. Neither were my friends, but like, you couldn't not notice it. Yeah. It's just, I don't know why I just never knew about it. Uh, I'm, Hated I video games, just, I guess. Apparently, but I thought I liked them, especially since I spent every waking hour of my free time <laughs> playing them. You'd think I'd know this shit. I don't know. Especially sure. growing up with like an NES, so I like knew retro. I didn't know like SNES or Nintendo 64, but you think i just know whatever it, it worked out in the end and that's all that matters i guess but i i just feel like here. we all, I, I, we I all got have here. different paths to get here i know i just feel like i missed out on so much like build up and cool stuff that you just wouldn't really see anymore sure and yeah, that's why I like learning about history so much because I like learning about what I missed out on. But it also just makes me sad. Like, damn, I missed out on cool shit. Yeah, I feel the same damn. way about all the big CGDQ fans and posts mm. on the SDA forums. And it's like, if I'd known any of this existed, I probably would have been really into it. Yeah. I don't know if I would have posted on forums. I would have needed, like, Spino.com to exist, probably, <laughs> but... Yeah, you're probably a little young for the forum posting arc, right? Yeah, I'm I'm 24, so. Yeah, people yeah. my age, we grew up posting on forums. Just so you know. <laughs> yeah, everyone, I, I was everyone had about their that. home forum. Yeah, I was talking about forums like yesterday with some people or something like. Yeah, I'm, I don't know. I'm 35. I I I came into the internet age as a forum poster. I had the heart mm -hmm. of a poster. Makes um, sense. Yeah, I I grew up teaching myself to program and posting on the Newgrounds forums a million years ago. Hmm. Newgrounds, huh? Yeah. That's how old I am. Sorry, I had to <laughs> anyway. Um yeah. What's funny thinking about it is around that time I was probably like a flash game player or something. Like, you know, Mario Flash game. I just need to play Mario. Like, <laughs> so. Nintendo's not making them fast enough for you. They're not making them fast enough. And they cost money. I don't have that. So, yeah. So that was like my internet usage back then. So, yeah. I, I never like, I was never like part of any community or like posted on something in that way. So I missed out on all of that. Not that I think I would have. But yeah, it wasn't until like speedrunning where I was like, oh yeah, I can just talk to people on the internet. Let's do that. Because I'd only just talk to my friends or whatever. Right. And it, it, it's cool that way. <laughs> yeah, Luckily, the, the speedrunning community is pretty sick too. So if I'm going to get started with the community, that's the one to do. Yeah, the speedrunning community is definitely kind of its own thing. It doesn't really match a lot of other... Um, I don't know. Online communities can be such a, a hit or miss thing. And oh, the speedrunning yeah. community, I think by virtue of the the spirit of speedrunning, you know, this sort of like I watch videos that other people made and I take those things and I apply them. Like it has this natural inbuilt concept of community. And like I think in some ways that can be overblown at times. People are people are very keen to say the phrase speedrunning community, like it's just one big group of people when it's not. Mm -hmm. But I do think that the spirit of speedrunning does lend itself well to people kind of coming together and and I don't know, just like being gracious in a group. Yeah. I mean, the community does do a lot of cool things in mm -hmm. a lot of cool ways. Yeah. Like, obviously, GDQ is like the main thing. Like, that's millions of dollars for charity twice a year. I mean, speed running. There it is. Yeah, we come to we come together for the big things like that. But then during the rest of the year, like, how often are you, like, just chatting up random Super Metroid runners? Yeah. It's like... 
I like I try and to communicate with someone like or... every day, honestly. Right. Not not people like I don't know well. Like that's what GDQ is right. for. You meet people, but like yeah. Right. I'll communicate with people like as much as I can on the internet. Cuz I think the speedrunning community is a very very in there is going to be sociology papers written <laughs> by people getting their PhDs one day about the speedrunning community because it is I think it's an interesting sort of group in that like we are a bunch of little communities but we're also a big community but it doesn't actually act like either of those things when you look mm -hmm. at it closely it's just a very interesting yeah it's a very interesting kind of thing yeah i haven't really thought of it that way but maybe maybe there would be papers i i mean i'm sure papers have been made on speedrunning already yeah when I was a lot so more active. Much. I used to get occasional requests from people who are like writing a paper on oh really speed writing, asking me to give some thoughts or something. I mean, it wasn't like every day, but you know, I think probably my in my heyday, I probably got three or four requests for like, hey, I'm writing this paper on speed running for class, or I'm writing my my thesis on this topic, and I'd love to ask you a few questions. Hmm. Fascinating. Just kind of an interesting an interesting yeah. ask is hey you're a random guy on the internet who plays video games made for children would you be willing to answer some questions for for my Co college paper graduate degree <laughs> that is interesting wow i i, I guess i like missed the air of like being reached out to for stuff <laughs> maybe i was yeah. better back then but there were less people you could talk to and it, the information wasn't as readily available because <laughs> i mean the information is so easy to find for anything now which yeah, is I was good gonna say also you're you're like considering your your bread and butter is super mario bros one at this point it's been written about so much that i think people are probably just cribbing everything that's been written previously about it yeah probably yeah although you know, in Lost Levels last year, I did find something new, but no one reported on it. Kotaku's really sleeping on you. Yeah. Well, no, they have written an article about me. I, I can't say they haven't. Okay. Um, I made I made a YouTube video where I put all the Mario 1 World Records together. Well, they all finish on the same frame, and then like all their pop-offs ha pop happen at once. They, <laughs> they, they wrote about that one. That's uh, good. Not very well. I think I remember but... <laughs> seeing that one, too. Yeah, I think it, like Bismuth got a pretty popular tweet based off of it, saying like Kotaku once again being the masters of gaming journalism because they like really fucked up some stuff. They went back and edited it, so I'll give them credit where it's due. Sure. But oh boy, that first draft was. Ugh. Can you imagine what a nightmare it would be to work at Kotaku and like take on the challenge to try to write about the speed ring community, like such a niche community? It's like you'll never make them happy. Oh God, no. <laughs> No matter what you write, they're going to hate you. Oh, although I feel like whatever they write, people hate it. So, I mean, it's yeah. fair. Wouldn't be any different. Sure. But, but yeah. yeah, I these days I definitely do a lot less speedrunning. I do occasionally still dip my toes into it. Um, I don't necessarily um, have the drive to just constantly do speedrunning as my main content. But like... Um, I still do a lot of bad games, and <laughs> when I do those, I'm usually doing them relatively fast. Um, and then occasionally I'll get the itch to speedrun something. Uh, most recently, I've run a handful of things. I, I think uh, the most recent thing that I ran was um, last year. I was doing runs of, of Fogs that had come out, uh, which was like a two-player physics game that I ran uh, with a friend of mine, the Great Gilder Sneeze. Um, but these days it's mostly like either a beloved game that I want to play more of. So I got really into Super Mario 3D World for a while mm. um, or touching back on an old speed run. I, I have this knack for, well, I mean, I guess it's not a, an unusual knack, but I have this knack for like grinding a game for a really long time and not not making any progress. And then I put down the game for a year and I come back and I, get a pb within like a week um so sometimes i think to myself i'm really doing myself a favor by taking a break mm -hmm. yeah breaks do help depends on what the break is for how long it is and all that but generally pretty good sure. would recommend um 
especially burnout never burn yourself out that's the number one advice if you're burnout either play something else or just step away i mean that's why i mean that's one of the main reasons why i originally started speed so many games is because for the first i mean it wasn't that long so i mean that that maybe wasn't a great sign but i think maybe like the first eight months or so that i was speed i just speed ran super mario world and i was kind of just getting tired of it mm -hmm. um and so I started branching out and playing more games. And I would come back to Super Mario World, and then I would go play some more games over here, and then I'd come back to Super Mario World. And so for probably like the first five years of speedrunning, I would say that I was active as a Super Mario World speedrunner, but I was playing all sorts of different things because I would I would take long breaks from Super Mario World to to like not burn out on it. Um, that's that's what got me through it. After a while, um, you just kind of run out of easy games so just <laughs> learn to avoid burnout so yeah um so i know you we mentioned that you're like silly game man <laughs> gdq staple um what are some like really good highlights for like games you've run um that are bad <laughs> Yeah, so my my bad games runs at GDQ have been uh, I ran Rocky and Bullwinkle for the NES, oh, which is good guy. <laughs> a very awful game. Oh yeah. Um, and then I ran Rocky and Bullwinkle for the Super Nintendo in a different year, um, which is still very bad, but just differently bad. Mm. Um, I ran a game called Sword of the Black Stone, which was a um. It was a game built in Unity by a solo dev. There's a lot of games on Steam that are just like someone's fun project that they put together mm -hmm. and they release it. And uh, it just happened to have some pretty cool glitches in it. So I ran it for a while. Uh, a lot of those games that I found for what it's worth were found through like friends who are very big into the bad game community. So like for instance, the great Gilder Sneeze uh, was doing for years a segment on his stream called Bad Game Theater. And he would find games and, and play them uh, from Steam. And occasionally he'd be like, hey, Author Blues, this game looks like it might be up your alley or it was kind of broken when I played it and you might enjoy messing around with it. And so I would just, I would get these games handed to me. I wouldn't really have to do a ton of work. I would just get these games handed to me where people said, seems kind of broken, you might enjoy speedrunning it. And I would, and I did. And um, those became like a staple for me at GDQ as games that were just kind of dropped in my lap. Mm -hmm. Rocky and Bullwinkle for the NES was from Big 20, the, the Big 20 that I did. I had to learn it for that. And I was like, okay, I can do more of this. Mm -hmm. Rocky and Bullwinkle for the Super Nintendo was a race on Cuso Grande, um, one of those tournaments. I found it and I ended up doing more runs of it. Um, Sword of the Blackstone was was from Bad Game Theater. So a lot of these games really weren't my doing. They were just like friends who found cool things and, and passed them off to me. So that was kind of nice. Yeah. So yep. how many games have I you run at GDQ? Uh, I can tell you in just a second. Oh, look. I, I forget because the bad games often get blocked out. Oh, I did Titanic as well. Titanic? The, um, oh. Yeah, I ran Is Titanic. Is that the I... like beat em up? Yeah, it's yeah. like a platformer beat em up uh, Famicom game. <laughs> um, I must have blocked that one out of my memory. Holy crap. That's um, fair. That's fair. So those are my four awful block games that I've played. Um, and then in uh, 2020, I did, um, I did Super Mario World 1 Mind with Lack Attack, oh, that. which is a Super Mario World ROM hack. It's like two controllers, one player, um, where every 30 frames it swaps which controller is controlling Mario. So like you're only controlling him half the time, and it, it flips back and forth really fast. So we did an 11 exit run of that. That was pretty damn good, if you ask me. I, I um, think one. Hold on. I think One Mind is the first thing I ever saw at a GDQ. Like I think SGQ 2018. I went to the practice room the first time. I made a setup someone sat down next to me and they were doing one mind mario world and i was just like what is that because i had never yeah. seen any i've never seen like rom hacks on console or anything that was just like what is going on over there sure so yeah um that's really cool 
Yeah, it's a very cool hack. It was made by Isofreeze, who we mentioned earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a it's a it's a strange idea, but it works so well. It's I think one of the most brilliant Super Mario World mods. Like not like full ROM hacks, but like mm-hmm. small mods that make the game more interesting. Uh, it's such a clever idea, and it works so well. Um, and me and Lack Attack, <laughs> it's kind of a funny story. Uh, so. A long time ago, um, me and Lack didn't live too far away from each other, and um, we we became friends over a shared love of speedrunning. And um, I taught him to run Super Mario World, so most of the strats he knew were like my strats, um, which matters because fast forward to like 2020, and he was like, "Hey, do you want to submit one mind to GDQ?" Um, which is a tough ask because he and I didn't live close to each other anymore so we couldn't practice regularly but the thing about one mind that's really unique about it is um if the two players have the same strategy (laughs) then theoretically it has no challenge right like if both players always press jump at the same time if they always fly at the same places if they always swim in the same way then it doesn't really matter who's controlling at which time because theoretically both players are doing what they're supposed to do do uh one mind really falls apart when the two players don't agree which is why it makes it like really fun content to watch two relative novices at super mario world play one mind together is because they (laughs) don't agree on what you're supposed to do at any one location in the game and so lack was like do you want to submit to agq and i was like well we're not going to get a chance to practice we'll only really get a chance to practice like in the practice rooms there at gdq and he's like well you taught me the game so like we have the same strategy i know (laughs) how you play and you know how i play and i was like all right we'll do it i was so nervous about it that year i actually had another run i had two runs at gdq i had an awful block game and i had one mind and i spent the whole week just practicing for one mind i would i would grab lack every moment i could i was like we're going to the practice room to do another hour of practice any opportunity i could get um and the run ended up turning out great but it was so nerve-wracking because i mean on one hand a run like that is designed to be chaotic so if we had failed at it no one would have faulted us but there is a certain amount of pressure that comes from being on the gdq stage like you don't want to make a fool of yourself like it, it you know, I preach that, like, you shouldn't let that sort of thing bother you. But, of course, you know, everyone gets a little bit of stage jitters. And you don't want to look like a fool in front of a huge audience. Um, so it was it was a very stressful run. Yeah. Was that HDQ 2020 then? Uh, yeah, that was 2020. Because I was going to say, it sounds familiar. I was there. So, surely I watched it. Yeah, so that was HDQ 2020. And then... <clears throat> the only other run I've ever done at GDQ after that was I did um I did Super Mario Brothers 35 the um mm, oh yeah I did the remember. Battle Royale we did a big showcase of it Yeah god I played that so much and then it died thanks Nintendo Unfortunately Unfortunately Yeah that was that was a big staple of my content and I got to play it at GDQ so I mean I'm I'm happy that I got that opportunity but it's a real bummer that game's not around anymore yeah, oh, it was so much fun. There have been um there have been sort of like fan projects of like bringing the servers back. So yeah, I've heard it, like but... th- there's still ways to play it, but I'm I'm too scared to homebrew my Switch. I I either feel I'm going to f- I don't like homebrewing like current consoles cuz sure. if you like fuck up then you're banned. And it's like, well, I don't sure. want to be banned, so I'm just too scared to, I guess. Yeah, I mean, you can do it on an emulator if you if your computer's good enough for that. I the whole reason why I don't is not because I don't think I could get it up and running. I'm not too worried about that, um, but I'm more worried that uh, I'm gonna put in a bunch of effort and then like, I mean, that game works well because you can get a group of thirty five together all the time, and if it relies on like home brewing and all that stuff to even be able to play it, like yeah. there's not gonna be probably thirty five people at any one time to play the game. Mm-hmm. yeah so it's probably less fun yeah it's a shame it was it was good i remember winning my first match i ever played and i went from rank one to like 32 and i was like yeah nice. this game was meant for me but yeah that uh I mean, it was 
Yeah, quite literally, but God, yeah. I remember that showcase very well. It was so hectic. Because it was you, Cosmic, I ate your Pioneta. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I watched the whole thing. I don't really like the point system they used. Because it's yeah, just... It's it was, hard to compare. It's hard. Because, like, there's so much RNG that goes into it, obviously. Because right. there's 34 people that are doing random shit. And it's like, okay. Yeah, but, we had talked for a while about how to, like, get a, a sensible scoring system up for that game. It was... It was it's tough because like with how much rng that game has and how how much like nonsense can happen to you it'd be very easy if you just like planned it based on how many wins each player got for like some several people to walk away with zero wins i mean yeah no no win was guaranteed to any of us in the short period of time we i think we only gave ourselves like an hour and a half mm -hmm. um so i mean there was no there was no guarantee anyone would get a win um but so we wanted to like encourage okay you can get points from a bunch of other ways but i think any scoring system that you you put together is going to end up being mostly arbitrary and maybe yeah. doesn't even decide the best player i mean i think adef killed it he, he did yeah. a great job and definitely deserved to win but mm -hmm. definitely it was just tough. i just remember watching it being like well that sucks <laughs> like some things <laughs> that happened but no sure. i i think like the outcome was good for sure yeah. like it was definitely done well just i mean again I think, it was i think what watch. matters is we all had a lot of fun and the, oh it was the, it was awesome the show was probably fun to watch i don't know I... yeah well i'm incredibly biased but i thought it was fun <laughs> so take that as you will everyone but... loves super mario brothers one so of course exactly yeah i did do it was like some little mario 35 thing i was invited to i think it was a gsa thing if you know them okay. so yeah yeah i did a i did a little bit of that so but it's God, fun game to take that sort of stuff and show off with it i mean you know it kind of i'm not i'm not like a first person shooter player so i don't really get the enjoyment of being able to drop into a battle royale and just like pub stomp mm -hmm. um like yeah. people who are actually good at first person shooters can just go in there and make free content because you know you can you may not win every game but you'll get 10 kills and like you you look like you're competent at the game because you're playing with a bunch of people who aren't as competent as you at the game and mm -hmm. god if 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 super mario brothers 35 wasn't built for people like you and me like <laughs> i mean we're very competent at super mario brothers 1 we know how to control the game we know where things are we know how to make good decisions and so like, it was so easy to pub stomp in that game. You know, you could get oh, yeah. at least top five every time without too much of a sweat. Yeah, if you, like, knew the game well, it was super easy to win. But then if you get, like, a bunch of top players into the same lobby, like, I would used to do that with people. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, now you need to get meta. You got to know how to play Mario 35. Not yeah, just Mario I, got, I got into some of those a few times. I had some people who watched my stream who were very big in like the Japanese uh, Mario 35 scene mm -hmm. and they would have groups where they would like organize joining the same lobbies at the same time and uh, I've never been so humbled but it was always a ton of fun just like mm -hmm. first trying my hardest to survive which is no small feat no. and then once you do get clobbered uh, just getting to watch the match afterwards and watching these really great players absolutely destroy that game was amazing yep it was such a perfect time and stripped away too soon <laughs> i'll never it get really over was. it yep on april fool's day no less what a joke yeah i talk about it a lot about how much it makes no sense to me that that game was taken away because it was so much fun and they didn't have to do anything other than just like leave the servers running but yeah oh but it was they had their free vision. so too bad <laughs> it was going to stop people from buying all their new games so they need to get rid of it yeah except like everyone that loved the game would have easily forked over some money for it so it's like you, you, you missed out if, you if it changed up. to a pay model and they were like you just have to pay like five bucks a month to continue playing it i would have yeah. i would have paid well i'm not a huge fan of like subscriptions of games i like to like own my game if i buy it but like sure if it's like all right um we're not even going to add any more content. It's just $20 now. It's not free to play anymore. It's like, all right, 
Works for me. Yeah. But no, Nintendo be Nintendo. So, Sag, <laughs> I guess. But yeah, good times, good times. I I forget you're like, you're good at Mario 1 too. We didn't talk about that. Yeah, I, I mean, my times aren't impressive, but I haven't put nearly as much time into it. I've got a sub-20 warp list. Uh, I like to I think not... that's good. <laughs> I do not have a good any percent time, but that's because I hate any percent. I mean, no. Hating any percent? No offense to you, I just don't like short Mario categories. I Hating any percent it? is perfectly based. Don't worry. Yeah, I, I just don't like short Mario categories. I don't like any category where, like, if I lose a quarter of a second, I should reset. Mm -hmm. I, I like long categories where I can, like, make a small mistake and then be like, okay, but I've got time to save later and I'll make up for it. Yeah, Warpless is the best category. So I love Warpless. I I genuinely think it's a fantastic category of a fantastic game. Although for me now it's like a nineteen minute any percent, but you know, <laughs> it was fun while it lasted. Yeah, the, that's the that's the big problem is the better you get at it, the the arms race for everyone to continue improving means that now it's just a much longer slog of playing perfectly. Yeah. But hey, I got to say I got the world record four times, so there you go. There you go. That's all that and matters, as I said. That's pretty much all that matters. Exactly. Former world record holder is a very prestigious title. Exactly. Especially when that counts at 180 now. <laughs> of a lot of things that don't matter, and the occasional thing that matters at least a little bit. But mostly things that don't matter. When you were playing all those games, did you get like a lot of world records and like the I did. I mean I don't I I never once put world record in any of my titles. I well... tried not to brag about it. Because I mean, more often than not, you're like going up either uncontested or against someone else's casual playthrough. That's that the they put fun a on. world record. I know. So I know, but I mean <laughs> at at the at the during my heyday of speedrunning, I was very opposed to this idea of like speedrunning for the purpose of world records. So I, well, had to, yeah. I had to stick to my principles and and be like, I'm not I'm not going to glorify pointless world records. Um, yeah. But you know, usually when I would learn a game, um, you know, when I was doing this challenge, try to play as many games as possible, I would set a target time for myself, and it was it would usually either be like I would look at the task and I would adjust appropriately for like what i thought i could actually do from it or i would look up long plays which long plays you mm -hmm. know nowadays they are much more explicit about it but at the time um most of the time long plays didn't advertise the fact that they were i don't want to say cheated they they like save state they, yeah there's tons game. of save states um and th and that's fine that that's the purpose of the channel is just to show the game being played so they're not doing anything wrong but like yeah. i would look at that run and i would try to beat that time which is i think perfectly reasonable i just wasn't using save states so mm -hmm. i would look at those times and and try to beat them or if someone had put up a run on the board and i thought that it seemed like it was attainable within a reasonable amount of time i would make that my target time and so um you know i i would say that along the way i got world records that i could be proud of um I was I was very determined that if I was going to take the time to learn a game, that I wasn't just going to do one run with a timer and be done with it. Like I was, mm -hmm. if if it meant beating an existing run, if it meant beating my own run, whatever that meant for me, however it took for me to get to a point where I was like happy with the run, I would play at least that long. Yeah, that's a good way to go about so, it. Yeah, I I definitely got a bunch of world records along the way. I don't think I ever added them up it, it's hard to keep track of them as well because there's a lot of times where once you know i i i was never a big huge streamer i'm still not a big huge streamer but um in the speedrun community i was well known enough that it was not uncommon for me to like put up a time in a game and like post a video and be happy with it and for people to come behind afterwards and then try to beat it mm -hmm. which i think is great mm -hmm. i think that if if one of the things that I contributed was creating impromptu speedrun <laughs> communities around underloved games. And that's, I think, a perfectly fine legacy. But it did mean that it was nearly impossible for me to actually keep track of, like, how many world records I had or which games I had the world records in. So Yeah. Yeah, I like keeping track of it, but I do it in a way where if I get one, I just write it down in this, like, little list I have. 
So. Sure. Because I don't think there's anything wrong with like being proud of your world records. I yeah. was definitely proud of the runs where I would like beat all the runs I was aware of. Mm -hmm. um, I just, I don't know. I, I, I was very principled about silly things back in the day. And like mm -hmm. one of the things was like the glorification of world records really irked me at times. And so I was, I was very like careful to like, I don't know. I, it, like drawing the line either between like being above it or being holier than thou or just like whatever the case may be i just i tried not to glorify the the pointless world records i had collected over time now uh, you gotta brag man yeah I that's, guess. that's what it's all about maybe then i'd be famous there you go yeah if you just said like holder of well no holding world records does not make you famous uh i i can i can attest but <laughs> I mean, you're kind of famous, right? Like, you asked me to be on your podcast, and I said yes, because you're okay. the famous GTAs. I see. Sure. Let, if that's the standard we're going off of, then yes. <laughs> but, I don't know. Depends no, I mean, on your I, definition. I, <laughs> yeah, I, I enjoyed it. I, I think that the speedrunning community, by and large, has historically had an issue with, like, glorification of world record in the sense that, like, you know, people, people point to things like, let's say Super Mario 64, like when, when Siglemic had the world record and people like, um, people like Punkation were first showing up on the scene. People like Cheese were first showing up on the scene. And like, there's always this sort of us versus them mentality. Like my streamer has the world record and like, mm -hmm. you'll never take it from them. And like, it's a very frustrating thing as a speed run content creator. I'm, I mean, I'm sure that you've experienced it as a, as an SMB one player, um, oh yeah. You know, you you have a lot of your own good reputation in your own right, but like no matter no matter what, like there's always like someone's shadow you might be in. And like that can be a little bit frustrating because it's like I've accomplished great things and I don't get the notoriety I deserve, and that happens a lot in the speedrunning community. It's not Well, if that isn't my fault. daily mindset. <laughs> wow. It's not anyone's fault that it happens. Like it's no. not meant nefariously. There's not like people who are trying to, you know, keep keep great speedrunners down but it, it is a bit of a frustrating aspect of the speedrunning yeah. community at times mm -hmm. that these these successful speedrunners are at the right place at the right time and they become super popular and super famous and i think that's great i think any attention that's brought to speedrunning anything that can potentially bring new people in who aren't aware of it is good for the hobby it's good for the community uh, but then you know it can be frustrating to see other people come along and not get the attention they deserve as well so mm -hmm. Yeah, I I mean, I've always felt weird about saying it this way because I don't want to sound like ungrateful or whatever, but I've always felt like overshadowed by everyone else. And Yeah, and that's a normal like insecurity to have is yeah. like feeling like feeling like there's other people who you play as well as, you are just as good and you're perfectly capable of doing great things, if not better than them at times and like you're still not like why okay, can but someone they come get over all the viewers interview me? Fuck? Yeah, exactly. That that's why I'm doing the interviewing now because no one ever asked there you me. Go. Well, that's not true. There you go. But um yeah, I've always like I'm trying to figure out how do I want to word this, but there are sometimes that like it the overshadowing makes me mad, but it's always like an anger at not like the person. Yeah. Like, I, I, you're gonna be friends with everyone. They're not doing anything wrong. It's this it's a specific like person or group of people at specific about a specific thing. Like one thing I remember vividly for some reason is I th it was like the first time I set the warpless record or something, or w maybe one of the later times. But I just remember this comment. It was, fuck you, this person deserves a record. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Yeah. Speedrun viewers are an interesting <laughs> creature at times. And uh, it's it's interesting. That can definitely be its own thing. But it, it can be hard, right, to separate that frustration that you feel about like being maybe underappreciated from mm -hmm. like and not and not being resentful toward the people who are getting that attention. I mean, yeah. you know through my years of speedrunning some of my dearest friends in speedrunning have been these super famous people darbian mm -hmm. is one of my dearest friends lack attack is one of my dearest friends uh and like 
I will never be as popular as they are for speedrunning, despite the fact that I think that my accomplishments in speedrunning are similarly impressive. I've speedrun mm -hmm. a ton of games. I've I've gotten world records. I'm quite capable in my own right. And like I I won't break that because or I won't I won't get out of that box because you know they were at the right place at the right time with the right game, um, and that's okay. There, but like it it can sometimes be hard to like get yourself mentally situated in a way where it's like I can be frustrated about that feeling but I'm not going to be resentful toward my friends for it mm -hmm. yeah like all of my good friends are the people that like overshadow me I do in the quotes you know but yeah part of the like mindset there at least that affects me is sometimes it like gets in your head and you like get more depressed about it more than angry it's like, sure. well, what am I doing wrong? Why am I, am I doing something wrong? Like it becomes almost a, a battle with yourself more than like a battle with the other people. And the answer that's is almost just always just wrong place at the wrong time. Unfortunately, yeah. like bad luck, bad RNG, nothing you can do. Yeah. I mean, uh, that's the reality of, of being, I, I mean, I've, I've been at streaming for 10 years now yeah. and I've seen people rocket to stardom who i have to ask the question like what did they do to earn mm -hmm. as much popularity as they did and i've i've got friends who i think are some of the most amazing streamers on the platform who don't get half the attention i do and i'm not doing anything mm -hmm. special um and it's like a lot of it just feels like it comes down to random happenstance i mean content yeah. creation is such a nonsense thing and speed runs speed running is affected by it all the same mm -hmm. yeah and that's why, like, I'll have, like, a bunch of different people on here to, like, especially, like, content creators. I like to figure out, like, well, how, do, how does that work? Like, because it, it's super interesting because, like, everyone has a different journey through. Like, speedrunning is so popular, but it, like, it's this weird thing where it was, like, so small for the longest time. Then it just blew up and, like, everyone knows what it is. But at the end of the day, it's still, like, this ridiculously small niche in comparison to most things. And it's yep. like the only thing you can really say that's like that. So people are so famous off of it, but in like a content way, people older got like from back in the day, got famous off of it for like more traditional stuff. And all of that's just like very interesting. Yeah. Because There's all the stories are so paths. different. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that speedrunning in particular, well, I mean, maybe not in particular, but I think with any niche hobby like speedrunning, it can be very hard to break out of it. Like, you know, yeah, I, I used to always, I used, I've, I've always reminded my other speedrunning friends, none of us are here forever. You know, we're, you're, you're not going to probably be a 70 year old still speedrunning. So there will come a time where you eventually finally say, you know, that's it for me. I'm, I'm done with speedrunning. And like the question is like, how do you pivot out of that? That can be a really hard thing to figure out because especially if whatever success you've amassed, whatever success you've achieved is built on speedrunning, how do you move away from speedrunning then? Um, I feel like I was very lucky that mine was an easy transition, right? I had built up a reputation for being a guy who speedruns so many games. So transitioning to a guy who plays so many games was not a big jump. That was not no. very hard. But like if you are zost and 99 mm percent -hmm. of your content is super metroid and now you want to become a variety streamer who streams games that aren't super metroid like how do you do that like most of your viewers are there certainly for you but they're there with the expectation of watching super metroid and mm -hmm. no viewer is required to watch every game you play so yeah that can be quite a hit oh yeah yeah i can't even think about pivoting out because i'm still trying to pivot in <laughs> like <laughs> I mean, this is out of my area of expertise. That's a know. lot of people's story as well, though. Like, like you know, I my partner Skybill, she is she was a great speedrunner. She did a ton of cool mm -hmm. speedrunning stuff, and she still does a lot of cool speedrunning stuff. Uh, but after a while, she was like, you know, I'm having such a hard time breaking through and and making success as a speedrun content creator. And she was like, I'm I'm gonna pivot away before she even fully broke in i would say i mean you know mm. she never got to the point where she was like achieving several hundred slash thousands of viewers like some big uh speed run content creators are capable of mm -hmm. and so sometimes you just have to say like i like what i'm doing but i'm gonna mix it with other things if the goal is to be like successful as a streamer slash content creator yeah that's the other thing i've noticed is like 
you know, especially since we've been talking about cyclamic a lot, that's like the example I use is you used to be able to get really famous just from traditional speed running. You can't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. it, it has to be like content focused. Sure. And yeah, that's hard to do. used to be able to stream 12 hours a day with no mic, no cam, mm -hmm. just the game on the screen. And that would do you it for you. Five digits. And yeah. You can't do that. That's anymore. tough now. And using Siglimic again as an example, Siglimic experienced the same thing. You know, he got done with Super Mario 64 finally. He grinded for probably a few more years after that big 2013 push, and he was still quite popular. And then, like, he was kind of, I'm mostly done with speedrunning. I don't really want to do it as much anymore. And he would stream, like, StarCraft 2 hmm. and get, like, no viewers. Yeah. Because that's a hard pivot to do. It's hard to come out of the speedrunning space as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's all, it's complicated. The internet is a complicated place, so. It is tough. All and you the can do is talk about harder. it. It gets harder and harder. Oh, you know? yeah. We're, we're now in an age where, I don't know, everyone has a Twitch stream, I guess. Like Pretty much, yeah. It's very saturated, and if you're looking at, you know, I, I think of, like, people who have been really successful both in speed rain and out of, like, I eat your pie. He, he mm -hmm. hit a huge amount of success doing um, Paper Mario for GDQ in like 2013, something like that. Um, maybe maybe even earlier than that. And uh, he got a ton of popularity for it and, and parlayed that into a successful variety stream. And now he's a huge streamer. He's mm -hmm. got tons of viewers. He can pull off a thousand with most any game he wants to play. And like, that's really impressive. But like, a lot of that is by virtue of the fact that the people who were involved in some of the earlier GDQs who were established as streamers, so people who went from GDQ and then went right back to streaming, and so those people had somewhere to go, I feel like there's a lot of growth there that just isn't possible in the same way anymore. Like, mm -hmm. if you go to GDQ, getting a run-in at GDQ doesn't move the needle anymore. No, it doesn't. Even, even if you're one of the top five runs at the very next GDQ, the likelihood of that affecting your viewership on Twitch is small. Um, and that can be frustrating. It feels like all of the traditional breakthroughs that speedrunners had into like some sort of success as a content creator have somewhat dried up, but mm -hmm. um, people find new ways. I mean, there's always success in becoming the best at like super popular games, but I mean, even then, do as many people watch, you know, Suiji or Ouija as they do watch Punkation and Cheese or Simply? Mm -hmm. I mean, I watch them all, but who knows if everyone's like me? I don't know. It Everyone helps that I've met like them all, friend. I guess, but <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I, I can speak firsthand about, like, having a really good GDQ run with, like, one of the higher viewer counts of the event and not getting anything from it. Yep. Which, yeah, like, yeah, it just doesn't happen. My, I don't I don't believe any of the runs I ever did at GDQ moved the needle significantly. I think mm -hmm. right after the Mario 35, I had a few people dropping by to watch some Mario 35, but we all know how that went. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, but I don't think any of the other runs really had any prominent effects. I think maybe, like, because Mario 35 was still active and popular that that might have helped a little bit more mm -hmm. but you know like especially with retro games yeah retro game fans and fans of speedrunning have mostly already found the streamers that they want to watch we're not we're not in hiding anymore yes <laughs> no it is not the niche it used to be that's for sure so it is again i i've talked about this on here before but like Speedrunning in popularity is this incredible exponential curve. It's wild to yeah, uh, see what's happening. That actually comes up a lot in, in streaming in general, though. Like, the, the amount of effort it takes to raise your stream from zero to one viewer is, like, an insurmountable wall. Mm -hmm. The amount it takes to get from, like, one to five flattens off a little more. From five to ten flattens off a little more. Once you get to like, I, in my opinion, I think the number is like about a hundred. If you can get over a hundred viewers on your own, the next hundred comes almost for free. It's like a buy mm -hmm. one, get one free deal hmm. because, because once you get to a certain size, you're much more visible. You're much more like easy to find. Like, you know, think about for instance, like your Twitch following directory. Um, you know, you're, you're toward the top of the list, so you're going to be 
more people's first choice for what they click. It's just, it's wild because it would feel like just getting one viewer shouldn't be that hard. Mm -hmm. But at those smaller numbers, it's like impossible. It, it really only becomes that snowball effect once you get to these much larger numbers. Mm -hmm. I remember, um, you know, back in 2018 or whatever, when I was first starting out, like the affiliate, just trying to get mm -hmm. to affiliate, like, what is it? You need 50 followers and then three average viewers in a month. Yeah, three. I think those, yeah, three. I hit 50 followers very quickly. It took like six or seven months after that to reach affiliate. It's so hard. It is. And I've, even I like five years later, I barely get more than three. Well, that's not entirely true, but it's not that much more in comparison to what you would see otherwise. Like it's I've hard. I've so many friends, content creators who have like quit Twitch because they couldn't get, you know, one mm -hmm. or two people to watch their stream. Like, I mean, I'll, I'll tune in when I can, but I can't be there all the time. But like, yeah. you know, so many people are just like, I, I can't get just a few people in my stream. Just one or two people typing in chat feels impossible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it is. It's, I don't, I don't know how people do it. It's yeah. so hard. I because mean, the other so thing is it's, for me now. it's no one's fault. Yeah. Like, I mean, if you're going to blame anyone, usually you say, like, oh, it's the streamer, the not entertaining. But that's not true either. Like, it, it, yeah, it's just, like, almost RNG, really. Yep. Unless you, like, I don't know, are on other platforms, too, and make things tailored to that, that will, like, hit the algorithm, and then you pull them in from there. That's, like, the only way to do it now, from what I've heard from people that are successful, is you have to pull right. them in elsewhere, because just Twitch streaming, Twitch isn't going to help you at all. <laughs> So. Yeah. Diversifying helps. I mean, you know, either like collaboration is a big part of mm -hmm. it. Uh, that's, that's been one of the things that's helped me the most is collaboration. Um, yeah. Working with other people. I mean, even when I was speed running, I would like, Hey, this new game just came out. Do you want to do a blind race with me? And so mm -hmm. like me and a friend would stream it together and, and race it. And I felt like those sorts of things helped, but yeah hard man it's hard did you do a lot of srl races back then oh yeah oh yeah my srl my srl race list is probably a mess mm. just just a ton of games i've only ever done one race of ever just the most nonsense list yeah i i've heard of that era just like random games one run ever just race it for fun <laughs> another thing i kind of missed out on i guess because i only yeah like, SRL kind of died off. I mean, let's just be honest. But right before it did, like, what was it? 2018, 2018 through 2020 is when, like, there'd be some tournaments and you'd, like, do races to practice and stuff. So I only have, like, a few games on my list. But races have always been really fun and just it, it's not really a thing anymore. Yeah, I um I did a lot of mystery tournaments early on. Um, when those were still happening more actively. They still happen, actually. Mystery Tournament got um, sort of picked back up steam. Um, but I used to do Mystery Tournament all the time because that sort of was self-serving in the sense that it was other people finding games that I might like to speedrun. So I would get to try a bunch of stuff. Um, and that definitely played a big role in my SRL race list. And, you know, there was also that early era. I don't know if... Um, if this is before you or not, but there was also this early era where the only way you could get listed on SRL's front page is you had to have a certain number of hours of races. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was a very common thing for a very long time for people to come along and be like, okay, I'm starting speed rain. I want to be on the SRL front page. Who's around for just a quick race of ducktails. Mm -hmm. All right. I'll, I'll do a race of ducktails. Okay. Who's around for just like a quick race of trip world for the game boy. All right. I'll do a race of trip world for the game boy. And so, you know, getting on the front page and then helping others get on the front page became a big thing of just like, all right, yeah, well, let's do a random race. I don't care. I'll do I'll do Chippendale Rescue Rangers again for the 10th time this week. Sure. Mm -hmm. There you go. Yeah. It just seems like it would have been a lot of fun. Um, it is. Yeah, I've just never... I guess I can't speak. It sounds like it, but as someone who's never done it because it died off by the time I got there, like, I don't really know. But... From what I've done in like the few races I have done, of, but again, those are like games I know well. Like, but yeah, you got to do mystery fun. tournament. Mystery Sign up for tournament. the next one. Oh, they still have them. Yeah, I oh. I believe they're still active. 
the most recent mystery tournament uh finals the, i i usually only hear about them these days from the finals but um i think i think gdq actually had the finals on their stream hmm. uh like six or eight months ago interesting because i could definitely see that being like a speed gaming thing but gdq picking yeah. it up uh. Well, it's not that GDQ would like run it, but but they um, just they showcase would... the finals. Yeah, they yeah. would they would lend their stream for just the finals of the of the tournament. Yeah, I just know that like speed gaming would like host the finals of some tournament that maybe wasn't streamed or something. Although, yeah, they right. usually do the streaming too, definitely. But huh, I mean that that's a big audience for the final. <laughs> Get involved in mystery tournament and you could become the next great mystery tournamenter. <laughs> it's amazing too. Mystery tournaments are such a fascinating microcosm of speedrunning because like you would think that because it's a bunch of random games that it's just a big jumble. Like who who would be good at what games would define like who gets to the finals. But really the mystery tournament sees the same faces so often get to the finals because there is this sort of common thread of being good at picking up a game you've never seen before and playing it well so you see people like captain drake and Anne for h and and like the same faces show up with some regularity not that no one else can win um but like that they at least are making it to the finals with some regularity because like that is a learned skill is being good at games you haven't played before mm -hmm. yeah it definitely sounds like fun to watch. I'll have to... I haven't convinced you? I haven't sold you on the idea? I don't know. I'm so, like... <laughs> you know, I'm so... I have to speedrun this and only this to, like, ever do a proper tournament anymore. But, I don't know. It, sound, it does sound fun to watch, though. Just, like, people try to play this g mystery game for the first time. And just, like... I don't know. That at least sounds fun to watch at the very least. Yeah, looking it up, the last time that Mystery Tournament wrapped up a tournament, Mystery Tournament 17's top eight was on GDQ on March 11th of this year. Mm. So yeah, they're still happening. Neat. Well, I'll have to like try to find where to watch it if they have, especially yeah. if they have the final scene. That sounds pretty interesting. But yeah, there's kind of fun. yeah, there's so many of those random speedrun things you like wouldn't know about it unless you were told about it or just knew where to look or something right like, there's so much of that i'm sure there's something out there i'd love to watch that i still just don't know exists or something i i don't even know i'd like it yet but it's probably it's probably something there <laughs> like, absolutely yeah um tournaments are just really right fun now. to watch they can be yeah um I, I really I think that tournament format is really good because it breaks a lot of people out of that shell of like only caring about the best run that has happened historically rather than like mm -hmm. I think I think the appeal of tournaments not mystery tournaments uh, specifically but just like in general I think the appeal of tournaments is that um, very often speedrunning focuses very heavily on like who has doing, done the best run ever um yeah. and tournament play really focuses on like who can play with some consistency mm -hmm. and which is a, a very different skill to learn um yep and i think that that's a lot of fun to give some focus to runner consistency yep this would be one warpless 2020 tournament champion right here <laughs> it's <was> fun <laughs> You've got the sauce. I, I did have the sauce back then. I had the record and the best consistency, so I won the tournament. It's pretty good. That's pretty impressive. And then that was the last uh, time the tournament was done, unfortunately. But it, that means just undefeated champion. So there you go. But yeah, I especially love, in terms of tournaments, um, the new, like, what do they call it? LTA? Like the live time attack format? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, it's a fun format. Um, it is. It's interesting. Because it's like, what if the whole, I don't know, like you see like a record history and like you look at leaderboards and see the top times, but it's like, what if that, but it was like only for two days, like yeah, two days of attempts to leaderboard for those two days. And it's just like, anyone can do that. 
I, I've joined yeah, some of those uh, that I've seen. Like that's a cool format. I I hope that we see more of that going forward because I yeah. think it combines both like the appeal of watching someone who's really high level go for interesting difficult strats but at the same time like you're rewarded for being consistent at whatever you do mm -hmm. yeah and i mean it's fun to like see the leaderboard and it's like look at all these people that can get all these times and get some more names up there um but yeah i really enjoy just joining those even if i'm not good at whatever it is like there's an smb3 one it was either like early this year or last year or something so it was Mario 3 Warpless. So it was just like six or seven hours one day. It was just an LTA. Again, GSA hosted it. And I actually got a 10-minute PB. So I was like, hell yeah. I went from like 104 to 54 minutes. And I was like, yes. Nice. And, you know, they have like a leaderboard for the top seven. And I was seventh place for just a little bit. But I was just like, <laughs> how did I get here? Right. It's funny. And then like all the people that are good started getting their fifty ones and stuff, and I'm like, okay, that looks that looks more normal, but th that's the fun of yeah, LTA. Never... That's the fun of participating. Like you can you don't have to be good, but it's still fun though. Yeah, yeah, it's fun. It's fun to participate in live events. Yeah, so I definitely hope LTAs take off more because they're fun to participate. They're fun to watch. Like it's just a win win for everyone. And sure. so. That that's like my favorite format now to watch, because like traditional tournaments, you have to like schedule your match. It's only two people, win or lose. Like, I mean, it's sure it's cool, but it can get old. But LTA, just any, and there's always content going on on the screen because there's so many people playing at once. Someone takes a break. All right, here's someone else. There you go. So just yeah, constant the, the action. appeal of that is definitely that that you kind of get some cycling in and out of people. Um, mm -hmm. That's one of the downsides of like big tournaments for, for a game. Like for instance, we used to have the super Mario world tournaments and we would do like a tournament for the no star world category. And both players hit the same, like sort of boring middle stretch of that category at the same time. And mm -hmm. it became like this running joke for like commentators to be like, all right, so what are we talking about now? Like, mm -hmm. What, what, what's our, what's our conversation for the next 20 minutes yeah. um but uh the nice thing about that sort of lta format is the fact that like if one part of the run is not as hype as some other or you know someone else is getting close to the end of the run you can kind of like cycle in these exciting moments so there's always something interesting happening mm -hmm. yeah um yeah i, I want to see i don't think i've seen a mario world one like lta format mm -mm. not to my knowledge yeah, that'd be interesting. Like, just 96 exit, all, someone's always in a different part of the run, and so much can happen. That'd be that'd be super interesting. That'd be nice to see. That game that'd would be cool. That game would go well with that format, I think. Uh, any game would, though. That's the other thing about it. Like, any game could go perfect with that. It's like, it's the new hip thing, but it, it, it like, it works. It's It's not like a bad fad. It's a good one. I like it. All right. And just yeah. take someone putting it together. Yeah. I think Super Mario would, would work for it. People just have to want to watch Super Mario up. World. Yeah. <laughs> oh, is that a problem? <laughs> uh, no, Super Mario World is, is mostly fine. Um, I gotta say, it's got one of like, the Super biggest leaderboards on SRC, honestly. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't think uh, there's a huge issue with um, viewership. Um, I, I think one of the big issues of Super Mario World has been that there's never really been, like, a person who stands out as getting, like, a ton of attention who, like, brings it all down on the game at once. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like like Darbian was for, for SMB1 or, um, like like Siglimic or Punkation or Cheese were for SM64. Like Super Mario World, despite its relative popularity, has never had like that one person that like every time they're live, they're getting so many viewers and everyone's watching it. The mm. big, if you, I mean, if you, if you trawl through the SM, uh, SMW uh, directory on Twitch, most of the time you're just seeing Kaizo, ROM Kaizo, hacks, ROM which are hack, fine. Yeah. I love them, but it's oh, not, yeah. it's not speedrunners. No. And that, I kind of wish they had like separate directories, but yeah, it makes sense that 
there isn't, but... It probably helps us that they don't have separate directories, so people scrolling through looking for ROM hacks get to see speedrunners and maybe... Mm. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe pop over. Yeah, but I mean, the like, ROM hacking in Kaiser scene is so massive. It, right. it, it's like... It, like, overshadows just general speedrunning, which in its own way is impressive. Sure. They're definitely separate things, even though they are the same game at heart. It's pretty interesting. Yeah, Super Mario World is probably the odd man out in that one, where the, um, like, the active ROM hacking scene overshadows the, yeah. the speedrunning scene. I think probably for a lot of other games that it just doesn't compare like speedrunners are probably the pinnacle of that category yeah. typically uh, but super mario world just has way too much going on with its with its rom hacking scene and so it just doesn't compare mm -hmm. that is interesting yeah it's probably the only game that it's backwards in that way like i, I mean there's a ton of great sm64 hacks but i imagine that on a given night that someone like cheese or simply or punctation are getting way more viewers than any oh, yeah. rom hack player oh yeah definitely although there aren't like no that's actually not true i was gonna say there's like not a lot of kaizo stuff but that's just wrong there's a ton of those so yeah i don't know it, it is just mario world is just the odd one out with that i guess it's kind of interesting sm64 kaizo has such a different flavor to it too i mean I, I don't know what it like you can't really compare them directly yeah it it's definitely its own thing but yeah it, it, it's cool nonetheless but yeah it does not get the same attention as like mario world does mario world is just wild it's but wild. i stand by what i said earlier i'm really impressed with what i've seen really recently in the sm64 hacking community and i'm i'm i i think we're gonna see a renaissance of sm64 rom hacking content coming very mm -hmm. soon i'm hopeful for it because even like they were making like really awesome fun to play mario 64 rom hacks in like the early 2010s so mm -hmm. that with an extra decade added on has just got to be insane and especially now that i mean you like, gotta it's codes out yeah. there now so yeah that's what i was gonna say is like previously the most impressive hacks were like the stuff that kaza was making he he has a intuitive and deep knowledge of how to modify that game to do what he wants now it's so much more accessible to more people now that there's a decomp i mean it's mm -hmm. not trivial to change the game but like that is way more accessible than expecting people to go in and make their modifications through you know like the assembly language yeah definitely yeah, so I, I think we're going to see some exciting things soon. Yeah, I don't know much about, like, ROM hacking a game. So I don't know, how like, how difficult that is and what tools you have to use to do such things. But Yeah, I mean, it comes in a lot of different flavors. If it's, if it's just, like, changing level design, usually people make editors for that kind of thing, and that's yeah. not too terribly difficult. But, like, if you want to make actual changes to the way the game runs... Usually you'd have to like look at the assembly code, discern what it means and, and make changes to it. And it's very hard to read. It, it's not, I mean, it, you know, programmers will say like assembly code's not that bad. And it's not like once you get the hang of it, but it's, it's inaccessible to the layperson. Mm -hmm. Whereas a full decomp, like something that's easily changed, easily modified, um, is going to make it accessible to so many more people. And so yep. that's why I think we're headed for a very exciting period of time i think the next few years of super mario 64 is going to be really exciting the first major rom hack using the decomp just came out and i played mm. through it and it was really impressive what they did with it like custom bosses tons of new mechanics tons of changes to the game and i think it bodes well for what we'll see in the future uh what hack is that uh super mario 64 beyond the cursed mirror oh i've heard of that okay yeah, it's the first, it, to my knowledge, it's the first major hack, like full length hack that was made with the decomp. And it shows because there's a ton of modifications hmm. to the game. Cool. Um, in like 2018, I was really into ROM hacks, like not streaming them, obviously, but like I would play like Mario World, the uh, vanilla level design contest stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that was really fun. And then there were like, uh, what were the... It was like Star Road, Green Stars, uh, 
that might have been all i got to but yeah i was sure. doing the mario 64 stuff and i mean it's really fun because the games go the games play well so just giving yep. more levels to play it in is really fun so i i really want to get into it more so if especially mario 64 if they make more like really cool fun stuff like i'd be all over that sometimes so i've been i've been very impressed in recent history but this one is the one that makes me confident that we're heading in a really good direction so cool so do you like play a lot of hacks as well uh it depends when ones get big enough to get my attention i do i played through uh super mario 3d super mario 64 land which was mm -hmm. kaza's big one he made like uh four years ago or so yeah um I, I loved that one. That was fantastic. It also hit my speedrunner brain worms really well because mm -hmm. it has like a built-in rating system for every single level. So, you know, the faster you play it, the better rating you get. And um, I, I don't know. I think uh, speedrunners tend to pivot well to challenging slash challenge runs in games. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that one, that one struck me well. Yeah. Um, I've played through a handful of other ones. I don't play as many as I'd like to because I play a ton of games and I like mm -hmm. a ton of games. But um, yeah, I'm always excited to play more cool ROM hacks. Yeah. Have, have you done like Kaizo Mario World? Uh, I have played some Kaizo SMW hacks. Um, I've beaten a handful of Kaizo hacks. I've beaten some really really rough hacks i've mm -hmm. uh i've i've done some some wild ones uh i haven't played as, like there's a a community of people who just play kaizo hacks and are very good at them and i yeah i can't hold a candle to them well, but yeah. you know with my uh limited amount of time i've spent with kaizo hacks i think i've got the sauce i i've, I've still got it in me i'm not too old um so there you go yeah like Kaizo's cool. It's fun to watch, but that's the kind of thing that I think I'd hate playing myself. Like, I just get so frustrated really yeah. easily. So, when I think of Mario World hacks, I like like the more just a new game. Like, Mario 64 hacks are. Or at least right. the ones I like. And sure. uh, surely there's like a ton of them, but like the Kaizo oh, yeah. scene is like so huge. Again, it like overshadows everything else. It's like yeah, hard you'd to be find excused for forward. thinking that there's not much in SMW hacking outside of Kaizo because mm -hmm. they're the ones that get the most notoriety, the most visibility. Uh, but there are a ton of like um, stand, like the 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 term that SMW Central uses for it is standard hacks, hacks that aren't designed to be mm -hmm. Kaizo, and there's so many of those that get produced as well. So yeah, if that's the sort of thing you're looking for. There's a lot of that out there to check out. Yep, so. Yep, Super Mario Central. What's like the site? SMW Central? Like, I'm trying to. SMWcentral.net. Yeah. And uh, for SM64, it's romhacking.com. Yep. So, would recommend both great sites to find some stuff. Yep. Um, I want to talk about like more smaller events. I know you go to, you're like invited to a lot of more, like not just GDQ. There's a lot of smaller events out there. The one I remember watching when i like when i first got into streaming it was like august or speed running was august 2017 is when i first started watching and like the next month there was this fun thing it was like S southern speedrunner summit or something mm -hmm. that was exactly the name southern speedrunning summit. awesome um, my brain is good <laughs> yeah i mean that was uh a side effect of the fact that you know first off the super mario world community um is pretty tight-knit and so most of the people that I knew were either part of the Super Mario World community or adjacent to it. And, um, you know, the Southeast is fairly dense, so we could get together. And so we, uh, a few summers, I think two or three of them, we all piled into Darbian's house and we put together a fun, goofy little weekend long marathon of everyone just playing whatever games they were excited about. Um, no real frills, but it was definitely designed to be like in the flavor of CGDQ. You know, mm -hmm. we're just on, we're just on some couches and and playing some games and talking to chat. Um, so pretty pretty low stakes. Yeah, they they were fun to watch, especially as like someone that was very new and like you know hadn't watched GDQ yet. It was like, oh, you can just get together and just play. Game. That's cool. And then you see GDQ, yeah. and it's like, oh, it's like. 
an established thing. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, you... I mean, mostly came from just like people who were adjacent to Super Mario World. So you know, Darby and had participated in Super Mario World tournaments occasionally. So he was a friend of mine. We often did races together. So, um, you know, he and I knew each other, and then. CT Conqueror was part of the Super Mario World scene. Sky Bills and I were part of the uh, Super Mario World scene. Rupert was part of the Super Mario World scene. Conster, um, X Dragon, just tons of individuals who mm -hmm. all had some sort of connection to it. And then, you know, Lack Attack got involved because he was friends with me. And then Milnium got involved because he was friends with Lack Attack. And mm -hmm. just like this little little microcosm of the speedrun community on the east coast and we all got together it was pretty fun yeah it was um it was basically just like getting together and playing video games but we put a stream on so mm -hmm. but yeah those are like the events i would like to be a part of more but they don't really happen and what made me realize that is uh i started going to the pace the gsa's thing because they keep accepting mm -hmm. my runs to it oh well but <laughs> what can yeah. you do but uh the first one I went to was last year, and there were only like a hundred and so people there. But, like, and I'm so used to going to GDQ, I'm not used to like those smaller get togethers. But it was like, you can like see anyone there at like any time, and you're more in tune to like go out into the world and do some fun thing together with people you wouldn't have like hung out with at a GDQ because GDQ has like the clicks and all that. They usually stay together. Sure. So it was, it was a lot more fun that way, I think. Yeah, there's definitely an appeal to smaller events. They're lower pressure. They're less exhausting mm -hmm. to at yeah. least an introvert like me. Um, yeah, it's it, they're definitely fun events. I mean, the reality is is that <clears throat> they could still happen and they do still happen. But by and large, people mostly do those sorts of things online these days. And mm -hmm. even then, um, like getting that together is just difficult for people so i mean you can plan it but um no one wants to take it upon themselves to do so yeah it would have never happened if darby and hadn't said yeah you can we can use my house like mm -hmm. i mean that's the reality of it is that like if you don't have something like that in place where someone's willing to offer up it can be very hard to put together yeah like that's the thing that sucks is they're super fun but it's just too hard to get everyone in one place Every everyone lives so far away at least for me no one lives near me so very sad right. but but yeah like yeah. smaller so events are like gdq has its own pros and cons but smaller events have their pros and cons too like they're very different stuff but it's it's fun and i just wish there were more stuff like that because i i would at least the first like sss like in 2017, I was still new, so I was still like learning how all of that worked. But I was really like engaged. It was fun to watch, like the battle mode. I remember plenty of that, and yep, the dragster leaderboard competition stuff going on in 2017. Yeah, we did a lot of silly things. Yeah, it was fun. And then I watched 2018 as well, and I was a little bit more. I I knew a little bit more about the people that were actually there. And then it just kind of stopped, but so I didn't. I didn't get to catch all of them, but they were fun. Yep. As with anything, people go their separate ways. So. Yeah, I know. It's a shame, but yeah, and that's the other thing about small events. I, again, I just wish there were more stuff like that, but it's just like so hard to make that work. But yeah. Well, now that we're all older and have means, you know, you can always just like rent an airbnb and <laughs> do a two-day marathon anytime you want to you just have to coordinate it with people yeah that can be hard but yeah, not impossible. that's the hard part that is the hard part it's not impossible but it's hard yeah again especially if everyone just lives so far away <laughs> and there almost needs to be like a reason to do it if someone's gonna like take the time out to do something like that i don't know I think there's a lot of value, though, to not sweating it. I mean, when we mm -hmm. did Southern Speed Rain Summit, we didn't raise money for anything. I think yeah. someone donated one time for us to get pizza. Oh, nice. <laughs> but, yeah, we weren't raising money for anything. Not to say that, I mean, 
it's great that the speedrunning community seems so dedicated to always like raising money for philanthropic efforts, but mm-hmm. um, I don't know. Sometimes it's nice to like just play games. Yeah. Yeah, it's nice to play games for sure. <laughs> but yeah, I, I just feel like in modern day, if you know, there's so many people that are busy doing whatever they're doing, it, there almost needs to be some sort of incentive to get a uh, group together to do something like that. I mean, m- maybe I'm wrong, but that's what it seems like to me. And that's why you don't see a lot of it unless there is like some charity aspect or some other aspect or like it's a meetup at some larger event and they're doing a small i mean that's how cgdq started right uh yeah it was associated with magfest initially mm-hmm. i think everyone was already going to be there so they were going to just do a little stream so yeah that, that's how it goes um so speaking of like the smaller events though because we talked about like the first thing i remember the last thing i remember is you just like were at one mm-hmm yeah, I went to, well, I mean, it wasn't a speedrunning event, but I just got back from uh, Kaizo Coliseum. Well, it was like speedrun uh, adjacent, I guess. Yeah, kind of. It was um, a get-together event with, um, <clears throat> it was uh, organized by Direct Relief. So this wasn't just like an event for Direct Relief. It was, it's actually like associated directly with Direct Relief staff. Oh, um, that's they cool. have They have like a team who... Um, specifically their like charity division Mm -hmm. um and they have like a budget to put on a few events a year um in order to raise money for direct relief which is a a more common way these days of uh like charity fundraising Mm -hmm. is like they'll have a team that's dedicated to this kind of thing and yeah we got together and we played a bunch of mario games and zelda games and all sorts of stuff uh 12 hours a day for three days um a lot of silly stuff as well. Um, I mean, there's a lot of there was a lot of speedrunning adjacent content, mm-hmm. and quite a few of us are who are involved with that event are like either former or current speedrunners. So mm-hmm. yeah, it's definitely got that speedrunning flavor to it, but it's mostly just like um, doing silly challenges and and raising money for charity by by getting people to donate for us to do nonsense. You know, mm-hmm. you ever play Super Mario 64 with oven mitts on your hands, it's much harder mm-hmm. than you think. Yeah. Seems like it'd be a little bit of a disadvantage. I was playing the Super Mario 64 Green Demon Challenge with oven mitts on my hands because people donated for it. That's got to be hard. <laughs> yeah. It was hard yeah. enough without the oven mitts. Yeah. Uh, Green Demon is interesting. I haven't really played it, but I've seen it, and I'm just like, how, how do you do that? I've done a lot of Green Demon. I've mm. I got a playthrough that I haven't finished from a while back that I've got like almost a hundred stars in. Doing Green wow. Demon All and right. it's a nightmare. Um, I can imagine. I've tried some Mario sixty four challenges here and there for fun, but nothing quite like that. I don't have the fear of this mushroom chasing you at all times. <laughs> Worst horror game ever made, but that's what it's about. That is what it's about. But yeah, um, I of course watched all of that Kaizo Coliseum stuff. Because again, I like the smaller group stuff. I think it's a lot more. Yeah, it has a different feeling to it. Yeah. There are pros and cons to the big and the small, but like both are fun to watch for their own reasons. And that one definitely was like, yeah, this is the small event. I, it kind of reminded me of the SSS stuff. Just like Messing around, few days, group in the same house, doing whatever, mostly speedrunners. So yeah, yeah, that's yeah, definitely it was a what blast. I was uh, we've got we've got another one coming up um, in October, uh, which is Speedrun Coliseum, which oh, is oh yeah, Spike's uh, Spike's thing. Yeah, Spike Vegeta's event. So, <laughs> so that one will be also uh, for direct relief, and uh, that's coming up in October from the sixth to the eighth, I think. Hmm. Is that announced, or are you leaking information? No, I think it's already posted on their website. Um, oh, okay. I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know if like the schedule's been posted, which is usually when they're when they do their big uh, like media push. Mm. But um, if you go to Direct Relief's page for Coliseums, it has six to the eighth. Mm-hmm. So I'm safe. I'm not in trouble. 
Yeah. All right. All right. I was just making sure. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I remember when I went to Pooh's event that was near me. Uh, Spike mm -hmm. was also there, and I was yeah, and I was like kind of low key bugging him, like, hey, I liked your speedrun coliseum. Uh, if 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 you need someone, you know, like I I, I play games. <laughs> nice. Because I remember, um, I remember the last one last year. And like that group of people, I like knew every single person there. And I was like, damn, I wish I was there. <laughs> yeah, uh, those sorts of small events are tough because yeah. like there are so many people who would be such a good fit for it. Like I'm not involved in the in the like uh deciding who goes to it. Yeah, but like course. there's so many people there who would be like such a great fit for it. And then you're at a place where you have enough room for twenty people and like how do you cut that down? It yeah, that's gotta be really hard yeah i i don't i don't know how that's done you almost just need to rent a bigger place just all right yeah, kind of yeah you, you gotta see like how many people you want and then just then get the place yeah base the place off the number of people exactly. you want to exactly and then just yeah. end up getting a thousand people <laughs> can't decide too many people here's a thousand people we're just making gdq again i'm very <laughs> lucky that um in my speed running and in my streams i've i've had the opportunity to like get to meet all of these people who have so many cool projects going on because like mm -hmm. these days i don't necessarily I, w I would argue that i don't have as much of a claim to participate in something like speedrun coliseum when there's other people who are definitely much more prominent active speedrunners like i'm obviously yeah. the event itself is not like just speedrunning we're doing like a lot of silly things and part of it is like getting big entertainers to be there which i guess i can ham it up for a crowd but um like it i am very fortunate that in my speed running career i've gotten an opportunity to meet people and get involved in so many cool projects so. yeah the my favorite part about speed running is going to events and stuff and, and yeah. it, it just always once i went to SGU for the first time i was like okay this is this is what it's all about like that, that's the fun part yeah. And yeah, so yeah. I'm making it my goal to like, I've been going to so many events this year specifically. I went to GDQ, I went to Pace, I'm going to Pace again, got another run. I'm going to a speed running adjacent thing in a couple weeks. Like, I don't have the money for it. I don't know what the fuck I'm doing, but it's just too much fun. I don't know. I'm addicted. Yeah. So Yeah, you want to be there. You want to be around people who have similar passions and interests to you. I mean... Yeah. I always told people that that's the reason why you go to GDQ. No one, mm -hmm. I mean, when you go to GDQ, no one cares about watching the marathon. Yeah, and yeah. You. there'll be like three um, runs that you want to see because you like yeah. know the person running. It's like, oh, this will be fun. And then after that, it's like you're in the day, you're in the practice room all day playing games yeah. at night. You're you want to be in the practice room. Drunk and partying. Friends. Yeah, you want to go to Maybe. dinners. You yeah. want to connect with people who have similar passions and hobbies to you. Like, I mean, that's what it's all about. Yeah, that's the best part about speedrunning, in my opinion. And I'm sure yep. a lot of people share that sentiment as well. So th that's what I'm here for. That's what I yep, like. Same. So yeah, hopefully just get to keep participating more of that cool stuff because that's that's what it's all about, as I said. And Absolutely. The more, the merrier. I just... <laughs> <laughs> Maybe my wallet's not happy with me, but... As long as I'm happy, who cares about what the wallet thinks? Am I right? Yeah. Money's just there to allow you to do the things you want to do. Yeah, exactly. Um, trying to think of other things. I think I've covered most of what I wanted to talk about, but I can do sure. some basic questions, I guess. You got me <laughs> <laughs> try to wrap things up. What are like the games you like to watch the most live games i like to watch yeah um so for speedrunning i'm still drawn to super mario 64 i don't think that's changed in all of my years of speedrunning if yeah. all things all things considered equal i'm probably going to pop on a super mario 64 stream um yeah they just never get old really so much can happen it's funny because there's like a huge disconnect between the games I enjoy playing and the games I enjoy watching. Mm -hmm. Like the game I have the most fun speed running is probably Super Mario World still, but I don't find myself watching very much Super Mario World. Mm -hmm. But 
I definitely watch a ton of SM64. Um, in terms of other games, I mean, I I tend to watch less speedrunning these days aside from my friends. Like, I'm more inclined to watch a friend speedrunning than I am to just, like, seek out a game. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, like, I watch a lot of Punkation and Cheese when they're on, but then, like, I watch a lot of smaller streamers who are just friends of mine. Mm-hmm. I want to watch their stream, so... Sometimes it's a mix of speedrunning obscure bad games. Sometimes it's watching them play Kaizo or whatever nonsense they're playing. Mm-hmm. Um, there's there's like certain types of things that it's like funny because if you watch my stream, you would think that I'm very into them, but I don't watch them very much. So like randomizers, for instance, like I love playing the few randomizers that I play when I get an opportunity to, but I don't watch very much randomizer content. I don't know. It's just like not easy for me to watch in the same way. So mm-hmm. that, that's, that's why my, my habits. Yeah. That's why I like asking the question, what do you like to watch? Because it's usually like different from what do you play? Right. Because if you're playing it, you don't want to just watch it more. <laughs> you want to watch something else. Yeah. I suppose that's probably true. So yeah, I, I, I like hearing the answer to that question when I ask it. Um, God, what else? I really think I just covered everything I can think of. <laughs> yeah, we made the rounds. Yeah, we kind of did. Uh, miss anything that you know of? <laughs> you no. know about yourself more than I. <laughs> I should hope. No, anyway. I mean these days. These days, I'm I'm mostly just like doing let's plays. I I like to play puzzle games. I'm very big into mm. puzzle games. Um, I enjoy some Metroidvanias. Um. I mean, I feel like I'm fairly well-rounded these days, just, like, playing whatever either new game pops into my, uh, you know, pops in front of me, or I, I often tell people that I got so fixated for so long on speedrunning that I kind of missed an entire era of games being released. You know, I had, mm-hmm. like, probably a six- to eight-year stretch of time where, like, if I wasn't going to speedrun something, I probably didn't play it at all. And so I have had a, a, a great time streaming all of these beloved games that people are shocked that i never got around to like you know a few years ago i played dark souls and people like how did you not play dark souls (laughs) well i mean i was speed running i just didn't get a chance to yeah um but i finally got around to it and so these days a lot of it's like catching up on games i missed out on the occasional new game that i'm interested in or uh, you know, going back through some retro games I missed growing up. You know, I was a Nintendo kid growing up, so I didn't play a lot of, like, Genesis or PlayStation games. So now I kind of get to go back and enjoy those fresh. I didn't mm-hmm. play a lot of JRPGs growing up, so I occasionally will play one. They're not my favorite genre, but, <laughs> you know, there's some really popular ones that I've gotten a chance to finally play. So, you know, I think that's one of the fun things about being a speedrunner who becomes a variety streamer is, like, there's really no shortage of games to play because you miss out on everything while you're speedrunning. Oh, there's so many games you can't play them all. You can't even play 0.1% of them. So I know. It keeps me up at night thinking about that. Yeah, like, I like just looking at random games. Like, I'll go to a platform for, like, a console I have and just look through the list for random crap that was released. I'm just like, oh, this looks like fun. I'll never play it, but it looks like fun. Because <laughs> that backlog will never end, but god someday someday i'd like to play more games but i am i am definitely on my like addicted to speed running and only speed running right now so we'll we'll see how things go i'm young right i got time yeah you've got time to get there <laughs> even even you have time <laughs> yep yep i still speed run occasionally when when i get the the itch yeah yeah it's nice to just do it when you feel like you want to it, yeah it's, it's got a nice different mindset that versus way. like yeah yeah, it's definitely a different mindset versus like, oh, I need to find a new thing to speedrun because that's what I do versus yeah. like, I'm going to play some games and then you play a game and you're like, oh, this was fun. I want to play it again with a timer. Yeah. Once you're variety, that's the whole point. You can do anything. That, that's what variety is. You can speedrun one day. You can casual the next. Who cares? Exactly. That's what we're here for. So <laughs> I, th- I think I'll go that route someday in my life, but definitely not right now. I... Once I'm like, I can't get world records anymore because I'm too washed, then 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 we'll move on. But there you go. I think that's the strategy. Anyway, that's the play. Yep. 
I think we can start wrapping it up. I think we covered everything, right. it sounds like. So uh, if you want to self-promote, feel free. Sure. Yeah, you can find me on Twitch primarily at Author Blues. Um, as long as Twitter still is alive, I'm there at Author Blues also. Mm -hmm. uh, my my VOD channel is at Author Blues on YouTube. Um, I mostly just upload unedited streams there these days, though it still does have a backlog of all of my speedrunning stuff. Um, and more recently, I I have an editor who makes short form videos for me. You can find that at Auth Clips on mm -hmm. YouTube. And all of those links are on the stream and in the description because I'm good that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I guess we'll wrap. We'll finish things off here. Thanks for watching, everybody. If you're watching live here and missed some content, it will be on YouTube shortly. If you're watching on YouTube, I stream these every week. Stay tuned because I do have next episode prepared as well. So, all right. Uh, thanks for being on and thanks for watching, everyone. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye.